Message from Goodwill and the Ad Council. Randy, Randy, we've got a problem. What? They go. Reality's here. Course, He's trying to crash the party. Reality? Who let him in? You sad? The people are mean. Well, I'm sorry. The world is in one big liberal arts college campus. I don't have an agenda like I want people to do something. I need them to do something. I want them to avoid irrationality. I guess the, what interests me is just like what interests everybody else. It's just sort of what, what feels what feels real. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a, uh, a Wednesday morning. Is that right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's and right. Look at your watch to make yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Right? The funny thing, Mr. Adams, is when I do that, it doesn't even tell me the day. It just tells me the date. So that still wouldn't help just, me. Just have it. Yeah, right. You're looking good. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. Yeah, I got your hair quaffed and everything yeah, that's yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. Through yeah. some, uh, through some. I see we product. have a beard this week. Well, you know, it's <laughs> this is my five o'clock shadow, Mr. Adams. I shaved last night. Isn't it? No, yeah. no, no, that's not yeah. true. No. I, know. I know, but uh, <laughs> you do grow it quite rapidly. Yeah, 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 that part's true. Anybody gets sad about the the lack of a beard, just, you know, give me a week. We'll, uh, we'll get it back going. <laughs> hey, we got to uh, have an incredible, incredible show. By the way, show. Roz will be here. Oh, um, yeah? She's just sick right now. So oh, she's poor Roz. She's trying to get herself together. All right. Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We'll get Roz in here. We, uh, we do have a great show today. Uh, goodness gracious, man. We have a slew of guests. Uh, the 8 o'clock... To 9 o'clock hour, we have, man, this guy is just, I'm not even sure how to describe him properly. He's just one of the most dynamic Second Amendment advocates in the arena right now. And what he does is just, it's, it's, it's what's absolutely needed for the Second Amendment for this particular time and possibly all time. The guy named is Maj Ture. He's the founder of a group called Black Guns Matters. Black Guns Matter. And it's, it's basically exactly like it sounds. Goes out there and advocates for Second Amendment rights. In particular, says that gun restriction rights are inherently racist, which is just an incredible talking point. It's such an effective talking point. Goodness gracious, man. Repealing the Second Amendment, gun buyback programs, restricting the Second Amendment is a racist principle. My goodness, if, if, if Republicans could get a hold of that... If there's a Republican out there that could get a hold of that and make this a, an effective talking point, that might shut down the entire argument. Maj Ture, he's on with us at 8. He's a solutionary hip-hop artist turned Second Amendment advocates from North Philly. Uh, his following began after he was featured on the cover of Philadelphia Weekly as, quote, the prophet of Philadelphia. He uh, founded Black Guns Matter in 2015, advocates for Second Amendment education and information. Uh, for urban communities, and this guy, he, he does stuff as simple as he'll go out and do uh, firearm safety training in the middle, just out in the streets, just out in the streets in, in, the, in the middle of, a, of an urban area. Now, obviously, he'll do it with air rifles and, and color-coded correctly, and, you know, some of the questions we're going to ask him are obviously, you know, well, hold on, hold on, you're in the middle of a, of a downtown area somewhere, an urban area, if you will, doing firearm safety training. Would you not have, would you not have some pushback from police? That's what the media tells us. Is it not? That's what the media should tell us. People are going to show up in swarms and start either protesting you or you're going to have police officers that are drawn down on you. No. What this guy says is, no, no, no. If they're, if they're legitimate officers, they want us to be trained correctly in firearms. They would much prefer proper training, proper licensing. Absolutely. Absolutely they would. We also have... Uh, Obviously, with this next guest that I'm going to announce here, next guests, plural, Victor Jernigan, Kelvin Moxley, they have a program that will be starting here on Saturdays. Mr. Adams is on the phone right now. Otherwise, I'd get him to uh, tell us the exact time of this program. But it's IPR, the intersection between politics and real estate. We brought this up a little bit yesterday. But this program is going to be fantastic. You think to yourself, well, hold on, the intersection between politics and real estate, how does that ever come up? And Cherry Voluntary on Voluntary Tuesday yesterday hit it right on the head. Uh, property rights. Yeah, absolutely. 
I would go on to say a little bit more than just property rights. Property rights, raising taxes, your community changing, a voice, having a voice. So, of course, Recode's going to come up a little bit today. Uh, Victor Jernigan, I'm, I think this is a guy that some people may know, some people may not know him. Kelvin Moxley is a guy that I'm, I'm um, one of the more, if not the most modest individual I've met before. Apparently had a, a, uh, a talk program here that was one of the, one of the more well-known talk programs either in this area or, or I'm not sure. Kelvin didn't tell me. I'm having to hear all this stuff about Kelvin from somebody else. That's how much, that's how modest this guy is. So we're going to have both these guys in here. So that's uh, Maz Ture at 8, talking Black Guns Matter. Victor Jernigan, Kelvin Moxley at 9. Get your calls ready for both those guys. If you want to talk Recode, obviously we're going to have to bring that up again. I mean, these are, I'm telling you, as much as you think that I may know about Recode, some of y'all think you don't know anything about Recode, Mr. Henry. <laughs> that's a maybe right. Okay, fine. <laughs> that's, I'll give you that one. I know, at least, I know at least a little bit. I've read through quite a bit of it. As far as the implications and the, and the you know the under uh, the intimate understanding of it, these two guys know far more than I do. So we're going to have to bring some of that up. But it's also much more pertaining to Victor Jernigan has story after story after story of just the simple premise of, hey, your taxes are being raised, possibly in the city or the county, you're not sure. Your taxes might be raised for uh, one community to put in a, a sidewalk or another another community to put in a, a high rise swanky hotel or not hotel but but apartment complex. Going to get into all this stuff. Also, some other housekeeping stuff. It, it is official. I, uh, it's official, Mr. Adams. I heard back from Google Play Music uh, two days ago and iTunes as of yesterday. Uh, this program's podcast is officially up on both those sites for your so podcast. You, you are news. somebody. Yeah, man, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, me and John down the street from you both have a podcast on iTunes now. <laughs> Who's John down the street? I don't know. The point being is that apparently anybody can throw a podcast up there. But either way, we're up there on iTunes. We're up there on Google Play Music. Now, you know, Mr. Henry, I'm somewhat averse to the whole social media tech thing. So I might have to get Daniel Blanchard or some of the guys to help me tweak a little bit the way that I'm, I'm throwing in uh, some of the descriptors. Um, right now, the only way I've found it on Google Play, and I know this sounds weird, I'm going to fix this, but I, the only way I found it on Google Play Music is to type in Real News Radio, Mr. Henry. I'm not sure what I did that makes it that way, but if you just type in Real News Radio, it gets lost in the whole, you know, nonsense of all the other podcasts out there. So I don't know what it is in iTunes. My wife has an iPhone. I didn't check her phone before I left, but somebody out there in Real News audience, check it for me. Uh, either on iTunes or Google Play Music, Real News Radio, or just Real News Radio, Mr. Henry. Do you know who I am? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I can't say that I do. That's Apple speaking as a female voice. I don't know how to put this. I'm trying to talk to you, iTunes. I'm trying to. I'm kind of a big deal. You better get it right, Tim really? Cook. People know me. Yeah, that's right, Apple. Well, I'm very happy for you. <laughs> hey, people know me, Tim Cook. I don't know if you knew that. Anyway, so we're all over the place now. Instagram, Facebook, all that stuff. Speaking of Facebook, just type in Real News Ready at your Facebook search bar. Love interacting in the comments. Uh, hang on, Mr. Adams. All right, yeah, yeah, the audio seems to be uh, all right on Facebook. Here's where I want to start with today, at least the first hour, because this is all you're going to hear about on national media coverage. <sighs> Honestly, Mr. Adams, I really don't even want to break this down. It's just such a stupid, stupid addition to this story, but I feel like I have to because everyone's going to be talking about it. Attorney General William Barr is going to show up and give some congressional hearings, some Senate hearings, and the big quote-unquote breaking news that came out last night. Did you hear this? Right, Mueller. Yeah, man. Yeah. I just – it's just he, – he, he, After all that, that, that he said, or I, I guess wrote, the, the bottom line was – but he did. He he didn't misrepresent it. No. <laughs> well, I, I know. And and after, so, after all of that, it, it really he wasn't saying anything that wasn't untrue. No, no, not at all. And even if you even if you want to step back one more time, I'll play this clip from CNN after this break. We have have come back. Mueller came out and said something. Barr possibly misrepresented his words. And I'm thinking, you guys have the Mueller report. What in the world would it even have mattered My what William first Barr thought. said? You right? can read it yourself. Go, it's it's right there in front of you. Well, well I don't know. The four page summary that William Barr gave. Who cares about the four page summary? Go read the four hundred page document. I did, not all of it, but I read about as much as I could. No joke. I'm about through two hundred twenty pages of at least the second part. I could I could care less about the first part. And the second aspect that I want to say, I'll say this to, multiple times throughout the day. Do your job, then, legislators. What am I talking about? Some, some people may not actually even know what, what it is that, that Mr. Adams and I are, are so upset about. Here's the headline from uh, MSN. This originally came from CNN. Mueller complained that Barr's letter did not capture, quote, the context of the Trump probe. Really? All right. 
Special Counsel Robert S. Mueller wrote a letter in late March complaining to Attorney General William Barr that a four-page memo to Congress describing the principal conclusions of the investigation into President Trump, quote, did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance. Really? Okay. Well, <laughs> it's four pages. It's it's 400-something pages condensed down into four. Yeah, I'm pretty sure anything you would condense down into four pages may not fully capture the context, nature, and substance, which is why you put it out to everybody, didn't you? Sure, 20-something pages were redacted, were, uh, redacted to the public, but there are select members of Congress and the Senate that saw the entire under unredacted version, except for the 6E material. Now, this is according to a copy of the letter reviewed Tuesday by the Washington Post. We've got to hit this break right now. We're going to come back, fill in the, uh, the information a little bit here, go to a, a clip from uh, Richard Blumenthal. And really, it's just legislators are looking for yet one more opportunity to put the onus. They want to put the blame on somebody else. They do not want to be responsible. By they, I mean Senate Rep Democrats, Senate Democrats, Congress, De House Democrats, doesn't matter. Those legislators that you, if you're listening to me in New York right now, if you're listening to me in some, some area that's elected a Democrat House member, if you're in Elon Omar's district, who knows? They don't want to take the onus for this. They don't want to take the blame for trying to push impeachment and it inevitably failing. It has to be on somebody else. More on that. 719. Be right back. They don't want to take the onus for this. They don't want to take the blame for trying to push impeachment and it inevitably failing. It has to be on somebody else. More on that. 719. Be right back. <laughs> Yeah, uh, legislators are supposed to do something. I'm not sure what that something is. And this Maz Ture guy is going to be real good, I'm thinking. Y'all know anything about him? And for whoever's in Facebook, Red Demon, who has... That most Americans want to free him. Come now, Tim Pool. Uh, hang on, hang on. Was that Red Demon in front of you? Oh, no! That's Kane! Hold on, have y'all not, not seen this yet? I'm gonna, let me see if I can do this. Oh, I can't. I'm going to mess up my... Let me, I don't know. Hang on, hang on. Hopefully the thing doesn't zoom in. Wait a minute. See, this is... Can you see that? Can you read it? It says, two grant best radio show host in the world, and then it's signed by Kane. And then there's a little Kane figurine. Hey, guys. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It's Glenn Jacobs, man. The coolest studio prop I got. Richard Esparza and, uh, and Glenn Jacobs worked that out last time they were in the studio for me. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little kid. I'm a dork. What of it? Want to fight about it? Who's that guy from Family Guy? He's always asking people if he wants to fight. Yeah, I'm a little kid. I used to dress up as Kane for Halloween. Want to fight about it? <laughs> Hey, what's going on? How are you? Uh, besides the obvious, I'm doing good. Hey. So, I mean, I mean, talk to me, man. What, what are the first thoughts that come to your mind when you hear something like this? This is the type of, um, I'm, I'm glad it got exposed. This is the type of foolishness that I'm glad. I, li I like my racism nice and exposed. <laughs> you know, uh, I'll take my little right. side of over easy eggs. <laughs> like, it's, it's that, like you said, it's, it's comical and sad at the same time, but it, it's, it's not something. Hey, it's Welcome back to Real News, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mr. Henry. Crown Plaza call number 865-888-TALK, 865-888-8255. From the FMT Insurance Studios. That's right. Broadcast Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. <laughs> All that stuff. That's right. Hey, yes, you know, sir. our sister station um, has a new FM. Do they? 
Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Joy 620, which is in seven different counties, and, you know, we've been here over 30 years. Uh, ha- we actu- actually have two new FMs. One is 99.5 in Sevier County and in Knox County. Just put it on a couple of weeks ago. That's 102.5. So people can hear Joy 620, the great Christian teaching over there, on at the two FM. If you're in Sevier County, 99.5, and if you're in Knox County, 102.5. Yeah, I was just going to get you to say the, one, the FMs one more time. That's awesome. So it's 102.5 here? Yeah, 102.5 in Knox County. All right. Just set that right next to 92.3 yeah, and yeah, go yeah. flip back and forth. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you're tired of hearing what Mr. Henry's saying because he's off his rocker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, don't change that dial. <laughs> ride the commercial waves, though. Hit a commercial here, ride it over into, uh, into 102.5. Uh, like I said, Maj Ture, Black Guns Matter coming up at 8. Uh, Victor Jernigan, Kelvin Moxley coming up at 9. Here's where we are today. And again, this is something I don't want to cover, so I may move on from this quickly. I just want the real news audience to be informed. I have a little bit of peace to speak on this. Uh, Mueller complained that Barr's letter did not capture the context of the Trump pro- probe. Quote, saying, uh, describing the principal conclusions of the investigation into President Trump, quote, did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of Mueller's work. Now, this is according to a copy of a letter reviewed Tuesday by the Washington Post. At the time the letter was sent on March 27th, Barr had announced that Mueller did not find, uh, sorry, had not found a conspiracy between Trump campaign and Russian officials seeking to interfere in the 2016 presidential election. Barr also said Mueller had not reached a conclusion about whether Trump had tried to obstruct justice. justice. But Barr reviewed the evidence and found it insufficient to support such a charge. We all heard him say that. Days after Barr's announcement, Mueller wrote a previously unknown letter to the Justice Department, which revealed a degree of dissatisfaction with the public discussion of Mueller's work that shocked senior Justice Department officials. Uh, According to who? I don't know. People familiar with the discussion? I don't even know what that means anymore, y'all. This is from, uh, let's see. Mueller wrote this, apparently. The summary letter the department sent to Congress and released to the public late in the afternoon, March, what's that? March 24th, yeah. Did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of this office's working conclusions. There is now public confusion about critical aspects of the results of our investigation. This threatens to undermine a central purpose for which the department appointed the special counsel to assure full public confidence in the outcome of the investigations. Well, then, uh, Mueller, then why did you kick the can? Why didn't you do something to assure full public confidence? We all read the report. Fine, but we didn't all read the report. We all watched commentary on those that said or allegedly read the report. But you could have at the end of it said, yes, he did or no, he didn't. And frankly speaking, Mr. Adams, at the end of the day, it is not a prosecutor's job to exonerate a defendant. It's not their job. It is their sole job to prosecute find evidence of criminality, and then indict based upon that criminality. We have a criminal justice system that says you are innocent until proven guilty. So if you are not proven guilty, if you have not enough evidence to indict or move forward on proven guilty, am I wrong in assuming that, okay, that seemingly exonerates at least at a criminal level? That's why I said from day one, Mr. Adams, the Mueller report, and I read through as much as I possibly can, was a legal exoneration of conspiracy and a legal a space legal exoneration of obstruction of justice. Now, that doesn't necessarily technically matter with what we're talking about now. Well, he really didn't do his job. No, he didn't. But at the end of, at the, end of the day, he should have said prosecute or, or indict or, uh, you know, they're, 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 we're going no further because there's not enough evidence. Yeah. But he basically said, uh, okay, here's, here's all the stuff, and uh, William Barr, you make up your mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and honestly, Mr. Adams, I've seen all these reports about President Trump trying to withhold financial disclosures, President Trump suing so that Deutsche Bank and Capital One don't release some of his, his uh, financial disclosures, uh, uh, William Barr now being unwilling, because the, the, the idea was that the Democrats in the House were going to initially question Barr themselves as the legislators are supposed to do, do your job, as I said before. Well, now what they're wanting to do is, and maybe even some of the Senate Judiciary Committee was considering this as well. It might even be them. I, I may be wrong, but somebody up there on the Hill was now, instead of the of the representatives asking questions to William Barr, it was going to be the representatives' attorneys. Right, the that attorneys. Were asking. And I'm thinking, man, hold on, hold on. 
on the Senate Judi- Judiciary Committee, on the Judiciary Committee, nearly 100% of those people are, are qualified attorneys themselves. Exactly. They've been practicing attorneys for a very long You know how to ask these questions. Moreover, it is entirely within the rules for your personal attorneys to hand you questions if you just want to read them verbatim. I'm not sure. It was such a weird process. It, it became such a strange process that, again, one more time, this seems like a Republican troll effort. I know that sounds wild to say, but you have to think about Trump's response within a 24-hour period. Okay, Look at it this way. Trump, throughout the last two years, yes, he's been very public about this is a witch hunt. Yes, he's been very public about, I don't know, what the 19 Democrats or the 20-something Democrats he's talking about. Yes, he's been very public about wanting this thing to shut down. But as far as what he is actually able to do to shut this down, how many times have we had a Linus or, or, or an Eddie or somebody else call in and just and try and throw out hypotheticals of this is what could be done to stop this investigation. This is what be, could be done under a legal context within the purview of the executive branch that could be done. Even when they were having uh, people go out there and talk to, I don't know, Sessions to go shut down the special counsel, that was still within the executive branch. What I'm saying is nothing was ever done. There was no executive privilege ever, ever, uh, you know, either enforced or even considered. We, when William Barr was asked if, they, if he would be okay, if Special Counsel Mueller came out there and gave testimony, William Barr was totally within his discretion, his own discretion, to say, Barr, Mueller works for me. This, this report is specifically for me. It's not for Congress. It's not for anybody else. It is a report to the Attorney General. No, I don't want him out there giving testimony, but what did he say? He said, sure, go out there, give as much testimony as you want. Now, what I'm saying is, look at the way President Trump has handled, the, and even CNN commentators were forced to say, even CNN's own legal experts were forced to say, I am flabbergasted at the amount that this presidency has allowed, has allowed interrogatories being answered, people being interviewed, 500 witnesses being put forward, how much terabytes worth of metadata being put forward. There was not a single instance that they tried to stall or stop something. In Mueller's own words, he even said there wasn't a shred of anything that we asked for that they didn't give us aside, aside from President Trump personally showing up. And if you're an attorney at all worth his salt or even know a minuscule amount of how the legal system works, nobody in their right mind is going to show up for a perjury trap. Nobody. So you look at all that. You look at over the past two years how this entire administration has been willing, entirely willing, on on a voluntary basis to work with this. And then in a 24-hour period, Trump flips. Trump absolutely flips. No, 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 we're not going to show up for that. No, we're not giving you questions. You want my financial information? You should have gotten it before. You want to see what my my family's working with? You should have gotten it before. Oh, the House wants to subpoena these records? Nope, not going to work with you. Has that, has that confused anybody else? Is anyone else sitting around at night trying to figure out why the administration, on, on the one hand, for the past two years has been in, so willing to give up whatever they've asked for? And then 24 hours after the Mueller report comes around, Trump says, no, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing at all. You're getting absolutely nothing. I think I have an answer for that. 731, hit this news break here, just coming up. We come back and get through a little bit more of uh, Mueller's actual letter. My opinion on uh, on what's going on. That we didn't know, you know, a lot of people thought. Yeah. You know, for some reason we still in 2016, people think that because you think outside of a box or the predetermined box for you, cookie cutter thing that somehow you're you're you know anti your own hood and that's the furthest thing from the truth and it's, it's sad like you said it's comical yeah there's a there's a weird
the kind of covert racism that I, that I mean, I've experienced it before. I've been at tables where I'm surrounded by super liberals who, and I say that because largely when I experience covert racism, that's generally who I'm around. Um, and, you know, they say things in such a manner as if I'm incapable of doing things on my own or as if that I have this inability to function in between preconceived notions of what I'm supposed to be. And, and, and the funny thing about it is, is it's rather blatant in many ways because even though I call it covert, it, it, it's really thinly masked. So when I hear stats and stuff about, you know, I shouldn't own a firearm because I'm a young black man and young black men die at a disproportionate rate to other young black men because they're shooting each other, on the surface, it sounds like, okay, you kind of sort of maybe care about me, but take it two, three, four layers deep. Really what you're saying is, I'm, I'm a monster monkey who anger man who's incapable of controlling my own emotions, therefore I shouldn't own a firearm because all I'm going to do is see the other monster, monster raging monkey man who looks like me and decide to kill him. That's essentially what they're telling Right, like you have absolutely no control, never mind the fact that, hey, I got this show called New War. Never mind the fact that I'm, I'm kind of like good at this shooting thing. But never mind the fact that I'm, you know, kind of trained and educated and informed. Just, well, your genetics, don't worry about all of that. Your genetics are telling me that you just ain't capable of controlling yourself. So listen to me and tell me exactly which way you should go, which way, you know, I should do things and all of that. I, it's, it's, the funny thing about it is I think sometimes in my mind, like, do you hear how you sound, or are you just running off this script that somebody told you? I, I want to almost believe that you're a victim of your own type of conditioning. Yeah. I, I have to believe that. I have to believe that you're not this stupid, especially <laughs> someone that's that high up on the political scheme thing. Yeah. You know? yeah, no, absolutely. It, it, there's, there's this kind of... You want the hand to be flipping off the man? I might get in trouble with that. It's tough though with this little this little wooden hand, because regardless of what position I put it in, somebody in Facebook is going to tell me it means something else. I, I used to have him doing this, and then Shine and Color Matt from Facebook told me, no, 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 that means that means something bad too. And then I used to have him just making the the fist. I guess I could just do the pinky alone, right? Like the Austin Powers, you know, uh, Dr. Evil pinky. We'll leave him with that for a little while. One million dollars, that type of thing. Let's see, let's see what kind of reaction that gets. Dr. Evil pinky. We'll leave him with that for a little while. One million dollars, that type of thing. Let's see, let's see what kind of reaction that gets. I don't, the underdog, my, my, my Negro disposition means that I'm going to do this or do that or not do this or not do that. But, you know, I've always been one to foster the idea and, I, uh, and the concept of, of independent thought. Mm -hmm. I may fall on one side or the other, but I arrive there by way of independent thought. And so I think for them, on, in that regard, what they like to do is they, they, they love and they thrive off the idea of groupthink. Groupthink, right. it, it, it enables them to, one, uh, completely confuse a lot of people about a, a myriad of topics and subjects. Sorry. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all. I'm writing some more notes for this interview. Hey, if any of y'all know anything about Maj Ture, y'all want some questions for him, uh, let me know. He's the founder of a group called Black Guns Matter. It's his contention that all gun laws are racist, which I think that is one of the most affecting, effective talking points I have ever heard when it comes to the gun control debate. All gun control laws are racist. Awesome.
But largely what it does is it forces people to be completely, utterly dependent on you. And, and right, and, right, and it, it boxes you in, so we, we can we can dole out what type of freedoms we kind of want to allow you to have, yeah. you know, which is the most un-American thing that I've ever seen in my life. You know, it's, it's, it's no different than saying, you know, there's a push now where if you, you know, you can't, if you have a medical marijuana card, you can't possibly have your license to carry because you can't do two things at once. Like, let, let us tell you how much, now slow down there with all this freedom that you're talking about. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's, it's just amazing to Because they can't control you with freedom. There's no control when there's freedom. And right. so, and, and I think that largely, you know, it's, they've almost kind of segmented off as, a, as the word freedom, talking about freedom in this sense. It's, All right. Let's do a radio show. <laughs> yeah, that's because this thing keeps zooming in on me here. Is that, yeah, that's better, right? Hey, 739, welcome back to Real News. I like that song. What was that? It's called Lies and Politicians. All right. By R.J. Green. Song kind of writes itself, I guess, huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Not much explanation needed on that <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, right. All right, so Fox News reporting on this bar to face dim grilling. Bar to face dim grilling in first Senate hearing since Mueller report release. Goodness, really? Senate Democrats are expected to grill Attorney General William Barr in a dramatic and explosive hearing on Wednesday morning. I suppose that's this morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Time as he faces lawmakers' questions for the first time since releasing Special Counsel Robert Mueller's Russia report. Amid accusations, he sought to present the investigation's findings in President Trump's favor. Now, we just went over a little bit, a little bit of what was from that letter himself. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll recap this here coming from CNN. Quote, this is from the letter, allegedly from the letter, quote, Washington Post, just a first report on this. The summary letter the department sent to Congress and released to the public late afternoon, March 24th, did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of this office's work and conclusions. There is now public confusion about the critical aspects of the results of our investigation. This threatens to undermine a central purpose for which the department's appoint, or sorry, for which the department appointed the special counsel to assure full public confidence in the outcomes of the investigations. Well, Mueller, one more time, you should have been the one that assured for full public confidence. If you didn't want to actually, if you just get the end of this, just kind of want to say, meh, yeah, whatever, I don't know. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't, you figure it out. If you're going to put it off on somebody else, and I've already given my reasons as to why I think he put it off on someone else. Mueller spent the first 200 pages excoriating the FBI. He spent the first 200 pages not finding a single shred of evidence for, let's be for real here, the FBI started this investigation. When the FBI started this investigation, what I mean by that, the FBI, the FBI investigation I'm talking about was, was, we're talking using the FISA court. Not telling the FISA court during obtaining that warrant to surveil Carter Page for two years. Not telling the FISA court that the Steele dossier, which was the major component of, of getting that warrant. I, I feel like I need to back up one more time. The FISA court warrant is ba it's, it's so that you can surveil foreign individuals. Russian oligarchs or parliament members, or it doesn't matter. You can first you can surveil someone of a, a foreign player, and you do not have to go through the Fourth Amendment to do so. Now, what ends up happening is while you're surveilling a foreign agent, foreign individual, foreign oligarch, parliament member, I don't know who it is. In this case, I guess it was Kislyak. Whoever you're surveilling, you can inadvertently what they you collect information on American. They call it incidental collections. So I'm talking to Kislyak on the phone. The conversations I'm having, I don't know why I'm talking to Kislyak, maybe I will one day. I'm talking to Kislyak on the phone. The conversations I'm having with him, they're picking up the entirety of the conversation. That's, that's text on a phone call, email exchange, text message exchange, I don't know what it is, but, but it is what it is. Well, my name should be redacted. That was a whole different issue of why Flynn's name was unredacted and released to, to, to media, all that stuff. So what we're talking, I'm going to make this make sense to Mueller again here in just a second. We're talking... The initial FBI investigation, 
that used the FISA court warrant to then surveil on Carter Page for two years. And oh, by the way, remember the hopscotch rule. If you surveil Carter Page, you can also, without having to get a warrant, a Fourth Amendment warrant or a FISA court warrant or anything, without having to get a warrant, you can then jump to two other players that, that Carter Page is, is communicating with. So if Carter Page communicates with Donald Trump Jr., Donald Trump Jr. communicates with his father, the now president, you now all of a sudden have rights to, to surveil the president of the United States. You understand that you're following along? And this whole thing by the FBI was set up by surveilling Carter Page through the, the, the primary component of getting that warrant was through the Steele dossier. Now we know the entire discredited deal do, Steele dossier. And now we know that the FBI didn't even think to tell the FISA court. Oh, by the way, yeah, this this is um, this was collected information um, that's uh, that's used. Maybe for a different campaign, maybe not necessarily as opposition. They didn't tell him it was going to be used as opposition research, and they certainly didn't tell him it was paid for by Hillary Clinton of the DNC. All right, so that's how the FBI investigation started. We have a House Intelligence Committee and a Senate Intelligence Committee that also looked over this information. We then have a two-year-long Mueller investigation. All of these four that I just described were solely looking solely looking at potential conspiracy. Collusion is, is not a legal word. They were looking at potential conspiracy through the Trump campaign and Russia. Never found a single thing. So back to the Mueller report. I said the reason why from the day one, I'm starting, the more I look into this, the more I'm starting to think Mueller was a bad, bad player. Mueller, he is who we thought he was. They are who we think they are. You know what I mean? From day one, I thought Mueller was a bad player. He had bad intentions. He hired 20 different Democrats. I mean, look at the Weissman stuff, right? I said from day one. So you look at the, the first part of this Mueller report. What he's looking at is that FBI investiga investigation, which was started under terrible, terrible precursors. They also personally investigated Donald Trump himself. We now know that started in, in 2017 or something. Personally investigated Donald Trump. What are the three reasons the FBI gave for personally investigating Donald Trump? Uh, because the Republicans said that they, uh, they wanted to remove a little piece of information in their own party member's uh, information that they didn't want to personally arm Ukraine. That has nothing to do with Trump. That Trump came out there and said that he, he wasn't on record about denouncing President Putin. And because he said on a single occasion, hey, you media members, if Russia gives you the, uh, the, the missing 30,000 emails, they'll probably give you some. Which was apparently a call to Russia to hack the DNC. And words, uh, word also came back from the committee, the, the panel, that uh, they were not investigating President Trump. Remember that? Yeah, very, very, right. No, we aren't. In, we we aren't investigating the the president. We're not going after him. Com Comey's it's under just oath. Just a lie. Comey's under oath two times, saying no, no, no. We we never investigated Trump. Exactly. And this this is what I'm saying, Mr. Adams. Mueller now is trying to look at all of this. He's trying to look at the, the department that – the Mueller was the longest-serving FBI director in American history aside from Hoover. Mueller is looking at, at his legacy here. He's not just looking at his legacy. He's also looking at trying – who he, who was he trying to exonerate? The FBI. The FBI's reputation. For the first 200 pages of this report, he has to destroy everybody in this country. Democrats, House Intelligence Committee, Senate Intelligence Committee. Uh, he also has to destroy the FBI for the two investigations that led to absolutely nothing. He has to try and exonerate the FBI's reputation for entirely circumventing the Fourth Amendment for something that never proved a single aspect of criminality in two solid years. Carter Page was never charged with anything based upon that surveillance. Carter Page was charged with lying to the FBI after the surveillance was done. Not anything they found during the surveillance. So back to the second part. Mueller, during the second part, the reason why he leaves it somewhat ambiguous is because if you are going to pursue impeachment, Mueller's not going to have that on his head. He's not going to have that on the FBI's head. He was sent there to protect the institution. He was sent there to revitalize the faith in this institution that has been rightfully so destroyed over the past couple of years. So he left it purposely ambiguous to say to House and Senate Democrats, if you're going to do this, that's on you. I'm not taking the blame for this. So now back to the issue at hand. I left the last break by saying Trump is doing something entirely different. He's now coming out where he was, he was, he was complicit with the investigation. He was working along. He was allowing whatever they wanted. And then the last couple of days here, him and all of his people have made a 180 flip. And think about it this way. Somebody said in Facebook the first days we were covering this. I'm not sure when it was. First couple of days we were covering this entire story. Somebody said in Facebook that the reason 
that Democrats are pushing so hard right now for the impeachment talk is not because they think it can actually happen. Republicans control the Senate. You're never going to get rid of this guy. Not because they think they can. can. Nobody in this country cares about the impeachment talk anymore. Nobody. Except the media and our elected representatives. They're the only ones. The media is still forcing themselves to try and convince the American people that people care. They don't care. Somebody said on Facebook what the Democrats are doing. I think this is right. They're trying to get out in front of the IG Horowitz report that's about to come. They're trying to get out in front of the Julian Assange testimony, the sealed indictments coming from Nunez, all of the stuff that Republicans have in the back end. I mean, we haven't even started talking about the, the unredacted version of the FISA court warrant. None of this stuff we've brought up yet. Now, what has Trump done in the meantime? It's not a poker game right now. They're playing tennis. Think about it this way. Trump is playing tennis with them. He's not throwing stuff back at them that he has up his sleeves. He's just hitting their own balls back at them. He's holding everything he possibly has. So Democrats come out and start talking impeachment, impeachment, impeachment. All Trump has to do is, nah, I'm not going to give you what you want. I'm not going to give you which one. He, they throw an impeachment ball at him. He hits that same impeachment ball back, whereas he could say, you guys are throwing an impeachment ball at me? Financial records, dealings with my family, Russian buildings being built. I don't know, whatever that is. You want you want uh, Capital One to release my credit card statements? He could throw back the IG Horowitz report. He could throw back the Nunez stuff. He's not yet. All he's doing is just stalling to further frustrate Democrats. The more frustrated Democrats become, the more they think they have something, the more they think they have something because Trump is allegedly hiding something that you couldn't find over the past three years, apparently. And, of course, the cable news is complicit with all They're this. eating it up, Mr. Adams. They are, they are eating it up like a, like a pig to a trough, man. They just don't realize that Trump's the one filling the trough. And before they know it, they're going to be so deeply rooted in the impeachment stuff. And then we're going to see the Horowitz report. And then we're going to see the Nunez stuff. And then we're going to see the unredacted FISA court. I'm telling you. I don't know if this is what's going on. This is just the way that I'm seeing it. Any politics fun. Any politics fun. 7.50 in the morning. Be right back. Yeah, they're back there. It's something that only uh, only the white boys over there can talk about. You're black. Come on over here with us where we give you stuff and make you feel good about yourself while still making you feel like a victim. Uh, right. But, you know. You got to tighten up. Come on. Well, that's an introduction. Friends, I'm Willis Lee. I'm pleased to be here. CPAC is pleased to have, first time on the main stage here at CPAC, on opening day, right. March 4A, Black Guns Matter. Give it up. Come on. Marge does the work of firearm safety and education and conflict resolution in urban America. Now, the format we're going to use today, though, because I want to make sure you get his message. I'm going to ask the question. Marge is going to respond to you. He's coming off of a 50-state tour that he's working on right now. He's been on NRA TV. He's been on Fox News, been on uh, the New York Times, all over the place. However, Marge, yes. you don't look or sound like your stereotypical Second Amendment advocate. Absolutely not. Who are you? And how did you get this gig on the main stage? Well, for one, thanks for, you know, Willis, thanks to you for, you know, being very supportive. Thanks to everybody, at, you know, coming out to see back. Thank you all for that. Um, I got I got here because um, doing work. A lot of times, what happens is, you know, in a, in a digital space, we make a lot of talk about whatever we make memes and things of that nature. But we have to put more conservative principles in urban America. So what our organization does is, we go to where there's high violence, high crime, high gun control, high, high slave mentality, to be perfectly honest, and inform urban America about their human rights, about as stated in the Second Amendment, to uh, defend their life. You know.
Auction, Fender Bender Severe Avenue, Severeville Pike and Severe Avenue. For all of your battery needs, for all of your battery needs, the lowest price and two-year warranties, get all the details at Master Battery, 947-1500. Seven fifty-three. Welcome back to Real News, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mr. Henry. I guess what I was saying during that last segment, if I can make sense of all this before we get to Roberta's phone call over here. Sometimes, either in sports or primarily, I, I suppose, in, in uh, the political realm, or maybe even war theory, I don't know, a defensive move can most accurately be categorized as an offensive move. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I know it probably doesn't. But, I, but in this particular sense, I think it does make sense. It seems like President Trump and his entire ilk right now are being, are, are being severely defensive. He has something to hide, they'll probably tell you, or they may have already told you. Or it certainly has a palpable feeling of. Why is he being so defensive? What does he not want us to know? It seems like President Trump is trying to defend against some potential claim or, or hide something that they may find out. Well, here's, here's the logic, or rather the illogic behind that situation. What in the world would he be trying to hide right now that has not been discoverable or already discovered over the last three years? Anderson Cooper, yet one more time as of last night, was back on the tip that... Now Mueller, again, is the best prosecutor of the nation. What in the world? So he was great, and then he became terrible when he didn't indict Trump, and now he's great again because he's saying something about Barr's misinterpretation. I don't know how they're not seeing this. I don't. A defensive move is most certainly an offensive application right now. When Trump is on the defense, what he's actually doing is playing offense. He's playing offense because he's forcing Democrats into his hand. Y'all seeing this, right? He's frustrating them because he thinks he's, – he's convincing them that he is frustrated. But more than likely, he realizes the same thing I realize now. Logically looking at the situation, if they would have something, they would have found it already, meaning they probably couldn't find anything else. And even these own Democrat representatives are telling us that they are not as capable as Mueller. Or his 20 Democrats. So if they're not as capable as Mueller or his 20 Democrats, then Mueller didn't find anything. You're not certainly going to find anything. So don't buy into Trump's frustration then. Well, you are. You are. And that's not even – he hasn't even started to go in the real offense yet. He hasn't. I mean, we went through at least just a, a small portion of the offensive strokes that he has left. Goodness. Let's go to Roberta. Let her end out this hour here. Roberta, uh, what's on your mind? About two minutes left. Sorry about that. Hi. The – Oh, the death of that woman at the synagogue. Friday night, there is a call out from the synagogue people. Put a candle in your window at sunset Friday night at the beginning of Sabbath to honor and to bring attention to what happened there. And... Uh, I think we really we need to light up America with the idea that this anti-Semitism, all of the anti-racial mess, it has to end. Mm. And we put a light in our window. We are sending a message that it stops here, that this woman did not need to die. Mm. And we do not need this kind of nonsense going on. But. Who put into that 19-year-old kid's mind this anti-Semitism? And whether it's Jewish or black or white men or whatever, enough. I hear you. Roberta, and I really hate to cut you off there because I completely, That's completely what? agree with that sentiment. We just have to hit this break. Uh, I love hearing from you, Roberta, and, I, and I, uh, I'll push that out there one more time. Gotta, it has to stop. Thank, thank you so much for calling, Roberta. Thank you. There goes Roberta. Hey, uh, 7.57 in the morning. Hit this quick break. News, traffic, weather, all that. Be right back with Maj Ture, uh, founder of Black Guns Matter.
Hello, this is Gerald Allison with Rocky Top, one hour heating and air and Benjamin Franklin Plumbing. Due to the mild weather, we're going to start spring early. We're offering a very special deal that we've never done before, our 19-point precision HVAC tune-up, along with our annual plumbing inspection, which involves draining your tank water heater, checking your fixtures and your drain for $99 for both. This is a $180 value normally. So take advantage of this super special. Due to the fact that we have some gaps in our schedule and I want to keep my guys working, we're offering this great special. You can reach us at 474-1511 to schedule or rockytopair.com. Now I'm going to stop talking and start singing. Nothing else can quite compare to Rocky Top One Hour Air. When you drive onto the lot at Fox Toyota, there's a welcome sign without there being a welcome sign. You just know you're welcome. Test drive one of the new vehicles today on the lot at Fox Toyota and be treated like family. Family owned and operated for decades. Fox Toyota, exit 122 off I-75 North or call them toll free 844-818-0255. Check out their website at foxtoyotaclinton.com. That's foxtoyotaclinton.com. Here's a news flash from Dayton Hilton of Dayton's Pest Control. Bed bugs have moved into this area, but don't worry, Dayton's is ready to help. I hear that Dayton's is one of two bed bug free trained companies in the state. We are. Dayton, please explain what your bed bug treatment entails. Well, first, don't throw your bed, mattress, box springs, or couch away. And we don't require any prep to your house prior to arrival. If you suspect you have bed bugs, call Dayton's at 588-6686 for an inspection and estimate. Dayton's reputation is your guarantee of quality. It's Lars Larson. Join me weeknights at 7 right here on Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. WETR, Knoxville's talk you can trust. New questions for the Attorney General. I'm Dave Anthony, Fox News, at a Senate hearing this morning over a letter Special Counsel Mueller wrote to him. Fox's Rachel Sutherland, live in Washington. Dave, just days after Attorney General William Barr released his summary findings of the Mueller report, the special counsel wrote him a letter saying the four-page memo did not fully capture the context, nature, and substance of his investigation. Robert Mueller also wrote, there is now public confusion about critical aspects of the results of our investigation. The Washington Post, to which obtained the letter, reported the two later spoke on the phone. During that conversation, Mueller said he did not believe Barr's summary memo to Congress was inaccurate, but he was concerned about the media coverage of the obstruction investigation. Dave? Rachel, Democrats are upset over the letter. Congresswoman Maxine Waters told MSNBC. This administration and all of those who are lined up with the president trying to protect him have obstructed not only justice, but obstructed Congress. Now, Democrats might subpoena Barr if he skips tomorrow's House hearing, but Republican Congressman John Ratcliffe told Fox. If you want to ask questions about a 448-page report, the guy we ought to be talking to is Bob Mueller, not yeah. Bill Barr. Venezuela's opposition leader, backed by the U.S., is calling for more protests, trying to oust disputed President Maduro. We don't know precisely when the moment is that he'll make the right decision for the people of Venezuela. He's shown an utter lack of regard or care uh, for their decency, for their dignity. Secretary of State Pompeo told Fox Business Cuba and Russia are helping Maduro and also Moscow. There'll be a vigil today at the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, after the shooting that left two dead, four wounded, three of them critically. All of a sudden, I just see, like, 30 to 50 kids just like running like a stampede towards me, screaming like, there's a shooter, there's a shooter. The accused gunman's a 22-year-old student now facing murder charges. A 13-year-old boy's in critical condition in Philadelphia. Shot after midnight right outside a supermarket he'd ridden his bike to. This is Fox News. All money managers might seem the same. But while some give their clients cookie-cutter portfolios... Fisher Investments tailors portfolios to your goals and needs. Some only call when they have something to sell. Fisher calls regularly, so you stay informed. And while some advisors are happy to earn commissions whether you do well or not, Fisher Investments fees are structured so we do better when you do better. In other words, we're on your side. Maybe that's why most of our clients come from other money managers. So if you're in or nearing retirement, talk with us and find out why investors are switching to and staying with Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments, clearly better money management. 
Investments in securities involve the risk of loss. Visit us at FisherInvestments.com to find out what we can do for you. Good morning. I'm Tanya Stout-Brown with a local news update on Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. Oak Ridge Police report a fatal traffic accident there. A vehicle was hit pulling out on Oak Ridge Turnpike from Newport Drive yesterday afternoon. The driver was pronounced dead on the scene. There was one non-life-threatening injury to another person involved in the crash. Names are being withheld pending notification of all next of kin. The deaths of seven people in Sumner County, Tennessee, were violent. The state medical examiner says the victims, all of them, either died as a result of blunt force trauma or sharp force injury. Among the dead, the parents of the suspected killer. He is 25-year-old Michael Cummins. Another victim was Cummins' uncle, and Cummins' grandmother survived. She is hospitalized in critical condition. Cummins has been in trouble with the law several times since 2013. In addition to the killings, he is accused of theft in this case. A new day, a new case of the measles. The state health department has confirmed what is now the fourth recent case of measles reported in East Tennessee. The first was a couple of weeks ago. The health department is following state and federal guidelines regarding patient privacy, so no information is being released about exactly where this current case came from or the name of the patient. And electric scooters are coming back to downtown Knoxville today. They return after some geofencing issues had them pulled from the streets earlier this year. Now you're up to date. I'm Tanya Stout-Brown on Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760, Knoxville's talk you can trust. Weather from the FMT Insurance Studios of Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. Another very warm and a little bit more humid day out there today as highs reach the mid to upper 80s. There's a slight chance for higher elevation shower. Most of you stay dry. We drop in the mid-60s tonight. A better chance for scattered afternoon storms Thursday, increasing on Friday into Saturday. Highs should be in the 70s, though. Low to mid-70s expected by the end of the coming weekend. Find great gifts and pampering spa treatments for mom at Spa 9700. All hobo bags and accessories, 20% off May 10th through 11th only. From the Six Storm Team, I'm Chief Meteorologist Matt Hinkin for the East Tennessee Weather Network. It's 64 at Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. Check out the all-you-can-eat pizza, pasta, and salad for lunch. Only ten ninety nine at the Powell location at Piro's Monday through Friday. Piro's in Powell on Emory Road at I-75, where the food is so good. Traffic from the FMT Insurance Studios of Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. We've got a wreck on 75 southbound. It looks like the right lane is blocked a little bit south of Merchant Road, and yeah, that's got things complicated back toward Callahan Road. Slow going, but I don't see lanes blocked. Alcoa Highway northbound through the construction. They're bogged down westbound at times, almost back to Cherry Street West, trying to make it through downtown Knoxville. We've got Smokey's Baseball tonight, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Pita Free Night tonight, Dollar Beverages Thursday night, Friday night specials, and Star Wars night on Saturday night, Smokey'sBaseball.com. Spin it again. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer... Seven in the morning. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Talk Radio 92.3 FM and AM 760, broadcasting live from the FMT Insurance Studios. This is Real News. My name is Mr. Henry. Let's go right now to our guest online, Maj Teray, hip-hop artist turned Second Amendment advocate from North Philly. Uh, his following began after he was featured on the cover of uh, Philadelphia Weekly as the prophet of Philadelphia, founded Black Guns Matter movement in 2015, and advocates for Second Amendment education and information for urban communities. Uh, sir, I have to say, 
one of the interviews I've been looking for, been doing this show for about three years now, and uh, in all sincerity, one of the interviews I've been looking forward to the most for quite some time. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, sir. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you. Let me just start with the uh, the question. It seems like every interview I've heard you do, this is the opening question. <laughs> it needs to be the opening question. Uh, what is Black Guns Matter? Uh, Black Guns Matter, we're a firearm safety and training organization. We deal with conflict resolution, de-escalation, um, and political education. We go to the areas where uh, there's high crime, uh, there's high violence, and that usually goes hand-in-hand with you know high gun control. So we go to those areas. We crowdsource completely. We um, offer these free classes to whoever wants to come to uh, learn about proper firearm safety, learn about the local laws, uh, learn about, again, conflict resolution and de-escalation, and their, you know, uh, our involvement with the Second Amendment. A lot of times urban America gets left out of that conversation. Mm. We're here to kind of fix that. And one of my favorite things I've heard you say before is you don't keep, don't keep a list of members, fully crowdsourced, right? Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And, absolutely. I don't, I, don't, I don't keep a list of members because... Um, I just believe that if somebody wants to identify themselves, they will. Mm. Mostly the people that wear the merchandise, they get a T-shirt, cool, they want to let you know what they're about. Um, If you don't, if you want to support us and you want to be a little bit more concealed with it, I want to respect that, right? So we got lists and emails and all of that, but I personally don't keep track of it. Um, I don't know. We might have two members. We might have two million. I have absolutely no idea, and I don't want to know. I want people to be able to decide whether they want to identify themselves or not. That's, that's, that's a little bit like, um, you know, that's kind of like uh, me, me, me jumping the gun, no pun intended, mm, mm. To, to just, you know, assume that somebody, because they support what we're doing, that they want to be identified in that way. I hear you. I absolutely love that. This statement right here, by the way, I also love, all gun control is racist. And, and without exaggeration, I find it to be one of the most effective slogans I've ever heard in my life. And an effort to assert the historicity behind this statement and the historical context of weapon control being racist makes for an extremely effective talking point. Can you explain or expound upon that a little bit more to our audience, why gun control or one gun laws are racist? Absolutely. Um, So first, uh, actually, gun control or racism and via gun control is older than America. When they were the still French colonies down in Louisiana, there were rules that said, you know, if you see a native or a black man, not even a woman, uh, with something that appears to look like a weapon, you are within your right to shoot him or her. Um, so that's one. And then right, fast forward a bit, you know, right after emancipation when black people, you know, linked up with cool white people, you know, Asian people, whatever, and fought for, you know, liberation. Um, right after that in Virginia, you have the first rule saying, hey, you know, gun control might be a thing, you know, for the black people that we kind of like we're just beating up. Now, I want to say this too. I don't want because I got a lot of white followers as well. We have a, we America. We have certain stains on our flag. That's just the reality. I'm not a person that believes that you should tear down statues or pretend like certain histories haven't happened. The reason why we look at these things is to make sure that we don't repeat them. And we also look at them as you know, hey, this happened, and it it, it now hasn't just been isolated just to black people. Yes, it is racist in its origin, its maintenance, and its expansion. But as the founding fathers to this nation knew, absolute power corrupts absolutely. So now it's spread into, you know, white America, suburban America. They'll use urban centers to dictate policy for the rest of the state to make all Americans, law-abiding citizens, not have the means to defend their life. But absolutely, the origin, expansion, and maintenance of gun control in this country is racist. I don't care what cute label they try to put on. Well, ultimately, and I, and I heard you just sort of stepping around it there, ultimately the, there's an aspect of control, right? I look at the, the Dred Scott case, okay, and, and one of the, the primary factors, maybe if it was dicta, I'm not sure, but in the Dred Scott case they said they were almost saying, I'm paraphrasing only slightly, God forbid we give black people the, the, right, the access to guns here because then they might be able to protect themselves. That was seriously one of, the, one of the aspects of the decision there. And what that said to me, you look retro, retroactively, what that says to me in today's time now is, it's just a little bit easier to control some versions of the populace if they can't protect themselves. Correct. And that's exactly why the major portions of gun control are always in urban centers. I mean, even if you jump outside of the race box for a minute, urban areas are the most densely populated areas in the country. New York, eight and a half million people. Los Angeles. All of these are Chicago. So what they'll do is they'll make sure that there's no understanding around firearm safety. There's a gang of ignorance. We remove civics from the schools public schools in those same areas. There's no attachment to the Second Amendment. There's ignorance, but at the same time, we Hmm. flood the area with uh, movies, television shows, everything that highlights the improper usage of firearms. We drop that information on top of the ignorance, 
you get a, a, it's a it's an easy equation. You get ignorance and trauma regards to that. Then those same urban centers, Chicago, they use those cities to create policy for the rest of the state. Wow. Illinois, which is le- way less people all across the state of Illinois. Where I'm from in Philadelphia. Philly's the only city of the first class in Pennsylvania, right? One million or more inhabitants or citizens, right? And they'll use that po- the policies and the ignorance around Philadelphia to try to create policy for the rest of, you know, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is an open carry state. But in Philadelphia, they say that if you carry, you have to carry concealed. Right. See, these are the contradictions that we're dealing with. And like you said, it's using one demographic to create, if we've made racism the thing, and if we created bias and fear in our uh, brothers and sisters that happen to be white or Spanish or Asian, oh, the black crazy people over there shouldn't have gun. See, they're killing each other. Mm. Never mentioning the fact that we have a strong and rich tradition of firearms in America. Never mentioning the fact that, you know, there's been ignorance and the actual safety and conflict resolution component has been taken out of that same area. Never mentioning that. But then making it look like, oh, we need these rules because look what's happening over there in Philadelphia. Also not mentioning that that rule isn't just let's just keep it for the black people. It's you, my white brothers and sisters, too. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Uh, the, the most uh, glaring point to that is this. You know who's killed and shot more by corrupt portions, because not all, corrupt portions of law enforcement in America? It's white male. Mm. It's white male. Mm. And when I'm saying that to my yo, bro, this is about control. Tyranny don't care. They'll use whatever they can use to maintain that absolute power, and they'll use the, one of the biggest things that they'll use is racism and our disunity as Americans to get that popping off. That's literally what's happening. It's the oldest trick in the book. Now, we, we just went through the historicity of that statement that all gun control is racist, but, but tell me if I'm wrong. What I'm hearing you say is, is, is fundamentally speaking, this is a human right, yeah? Absolutely, it's a human right. The thing that the Founding Fathers got, and let me be clear, I don't deify anybody. The Founding Fathers had some they wrote some great stuff, but they had contradictions. At a time when somebody appears like Thomas Paine was like, nah, I'm not doing a slavery thing. Er, certain founding fathers also had, you know, a human. With that being the case, I want to be very clear and objective. However, founding fathers, what they got tremendously right was, hey, guys, let's double down on a list called the Bill of Rights that are not granted by government. Right. This don't got nothing to do with the government. Just in case we, it's like the four dummies version. If in 200 years from now, <laughs> right. all Americans get dumb, yeah. right? Which, which, it's which literally we right there. Yeah. Right. right. These are things that are not granted by government. You have them as birthright. That's the purpose of making sure that civics, especially in urban environments, is not in the schools. Wow. You can't have young white kids, young Spanish kids, young black kids knowing that they're a part of that same history because if they're detached from it, they don't feel an, uh, any type of empowerment by it. And then if we start taking it away, have young people down in Florida, for example, advocating that we need less rights, less guns. Well, the young people want it, you know, because you're not talking about the bigger picture. So, yes, it's a fundamental human right. I don't care what a government says. We tell the government what to do, not the other way around. That is Civics 101, and the Founding Fathers had a slam dunk when they wrote that uh, Bill of Rights. That, yeah, we only have about a minute left for this break, and I want to be respectful of your time to see if we can keep you through a few more segments here. But in this next minute, if you can, do you, do you find that there's a concerted effort to – I'm not even best, uh, sure the best way to, to phrase this – a concerted effort to keep certain communities in the dark there? You get what I'm saying? By way of education, the, the teachers just aren't teaching? I mean, what is that? So teachers have to do what the school district allows as their plans, as their lesson plans. If it's not allowed, it doesn't get in. And there's great teachers that want to teach this type of stuff. The reality is it's not even a concerted effort. It is a conspiracy, not a theory. It is a a group of people conspiring to make sure that our young people are voting in opposition to their interests. And I can Hmm. go on. I'm here for a couple of segments if you need me to be. Gotcha. Fantastic. Yeah, well, we'll set up this break right now because, I I mean, I want to get into some of these other questions of asking him when we we go back on this break of, look, we got got a wide demographic, a wide swath of folks that listen to this program, uh, literally all across the world. We got people from Albania Albania to listen, but I'm wondering – you know, conservatives drop the ball in trying to push this message here. I'm also wondering if this is a Democrat-Republican issue. Uh, I'm wondering a few other things of, of our politicians just getting this wrong for the lack of information. But, uh, but Maj Ture is joining us. I'll put him back on hold as we set this, seg- this break up right now. Hit this break. I'm telling you all, just the first segment already. Did I not tell you? 
I tried to tell you it's going to be one of the most dynamic interviews we've done in this program in a while. 8.17 now in the morning. Hit this break. Be right back. From a cold dead hand. Guys, the truth, man. More people like him would be all right. Goodness. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, his message is just so much bigger than, than just the Second Amendment, man. It's, mm. it's good stuff. Leave me on water boards. Oh, you got water. Why are y'all leaving? Today, they want Ash from Black Guns Matter. What's up? Uh, all the way from Philly. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, I am a big fan of yours and what you're doing. Absolutely. So the issue, the first question, it's an obvious question. Why is this issue so important to you? And well, why is it have to, why is it gotta be black? It's gotta be black because most uh, semi-automatic firearms are black. <laughs> just one. Um, and America just has a really um, we have a rich in tradition a, a rich tradition in regards to firearms, but we also have a rich tradition in regards to uh, making sure that people of color do not have firearms. Um, racial uh, profiling in regards to you know the Second Amendment existed before America was even created. You know, um, you know, you got the, the French, you know, black laws, black codes and things like that. It was like, yo, if you run up on, happen to see a black dude, black person, if they got anything that looks like a weapon, you know, if they don't comply, you're allowed to beat them and potentially kill them. Wow, okay. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So that was like in Louisiana. Um, so th this is something that, you know, um, people of color need to be aware of because it's a human right. You know, as stated in the Second Amendment by the founding fathers of this nation, the framers, of this construct, you know, so just getting people from urban America involved and getting them understanding that, like, yo, I don't really care what somebody else initially thought or the, the, the spooky game that they're trying to convince you that you're not supposed to be a part of that. Nah, if you pay taxes, you work in, you, you know, you do what you do. You have the human right that's not granted by government to defend your life. Uh, but how, is this something you've always felt, or was this a kind of moment where you had this big epiphany? Well, I've always had guns, even unlawfully. I've always <laughs> like. <laughs> They always been around, you know. Um, but just and getting more information and studying more people, studying more historians, and, and emulating some of those freedom fighters. When you talk about a Harriet Tubman, when you talk about a Malcolm X, when you talk about a Patrick Henry, when you talk about a, you know a Thomas Paine, these were men and women that was like, yeah, we bought this gun. Can I cuss? Yeah, of course. Oh yeah, we bought this gun shit. You know what I mean? And so the the reason for that being like the Second Amendment, even after. Constitution is like, hey guys, let's double down with the Bill of Rights. First one, you can say what you mean. Second, you can defend what you just said. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, I've always thought this way, but. Hey, welcome back to Real News, ladies and gentlemen. Hey, my name is Mr. Henry, broadcasting live from the FMT Insurance Studios. Go right back now to our guest online, Maj Ture, uh, founder of Black Guns Matters. Let me start with this question as we picked up from where we left off before. I said we have we have a, a wide swath of demographic that, li that listens to this program. I, I see people on this uh, Facebook uh, feed from, from uh, Albania. I, I see them all over the place. African Americans, Caucasians, Asian Americans, doesn't matter. Uh, who needs to hear this message? Let me ask a two-part question here to you, sir. Who needs to hear your message? And and maybe, more importantly, do, do you see in any sense the conservatives, have we done enough to, to, to help on this issue for urban America? So, one, all Americans need to hear this uh, message first and foremost because we're intertwined. I know, I know I, and let me be clear, having a respect for your, your heritage, your ethnicity, all of those different things, if you're Spanish-American, Mexican-American, Asian-American, African-American, it's important that we have that respect for heritage and culture. However, when you start traveling around the country, when you check that passport, it's going to say United States citizen. Mm. It's going to happen. It's not, it's, not, it's not me making it up. It's what happens. So I think all Americans need to hear it because and it's one. Outside, the, the other part of that is the reason why that is because by making it continue to be separate, that doesn't mean you can't have a respect for your heritage. But to make it separate, oh, oh, they white, oh, they black, oh, they Spanish, oh, they Mexican. When you do it that way, that unseen hand can it's, it's divide and conquer. Again, that's another old trick in the book. So all Americans need to hear it because all Americans have been hit 
with that mass media uh, falsehood that, oh, it's, the, it's those guys over there. It's the white guys over there. It's the black guys over there. So forth and so on. So all Americans need to hear it and expose that contradiction. As far as conservatives, absolutely not. I'm a liberty guy. I'm a freedom guy. I'm a conservative guy. We, as conservatives, black, white, Spanish, doesn't matter, have not done enough to engage urban America. Urban America is like, it's like the target-rich environment because you get all of those different ethnicities. You get hardworking people. Most people that, that are your listeners right now aren't really like rich people. They live in a hood, whether that's a rural hood, a suburban hood, an urban hood. We're not rich. We don't live in gated communities. We are the people that are uh, the ones that they, you know, certain small segments of the population or people in positions of power are trying to keep disunified. So the conservative movement has failed in that regard because we haven't translated the conservative ideologies that are already there in urban America. We work hard. We make, you know, for the most part, sound financial choices. So we have to do more in that regard. Absolutely. Hmm. Kelly says on Facebook here, went to go ahead and uh, liked his page, love his knowledge and his honesty. We need many more like him Uh, in that in that vein here. I want to say, of course, today we're talking about the Second Amendment. uh, But it seems like the message, at least from talking to you right now and prepping for this interview, it seems like the message of Black Guns Matter is much bigger than that. Sort of a fundamental underlying message of self-fulfillment, self-responsibility, self-education. Do you see it as that part of charge in your life? You're, You're sort of calling in life to do obviously it's Second Amendment today, but it's much bigger than that. It's way bigger than that. Second Amendment is just one aspect. That's just we got to secure the base of having the ability to defend whatever, defend whatever freedoms we believe in. Having a firearm is just a tool. A safe and responsible you know, gun owner is just someone, a patriot, that understands that he's willing to protect his countrymen and countrywomen against tyranny, whether that's foreign or domestic. The tool is just a firearm to do that. But after we get past, get past the Second Amendment in the sense of, okay, we got everybody on board with this liberty conversation, now we can start having a conversation about natural rights, wow. about human rights, about good citizenship, about you know, um, property rights, about how there's too many laws on the book. The firearm is just the means to defend those value systems while we're having nice and civil conversations around those larger concepts and then creating structures, or I should even say reverting back to the structures, Constitution, Bill of Rights, that we already have to defend those things. So the firearm is one component of it, but the bigger component of it is good citizenship. Hmm. I want to give you an opportunity now. I want to give you at least a segment and a half here to, to make your pitch and really make sure all my audience is as enthralled with you as I am. Now that we've done that and established that, I'm pretty sure, go ahead and tell our audience, if you can, uh, where the best place to find some of your information is. Facebook, Twitter, uh, I don't, any accounts for anything you want them to know about. So there's three ways. Again, like we said earlier, these, these classes that we're doing, we want to limit the barriers to entry. So we want these classes. They're very basic. We want someone to come into our class Leave with an understanding of the Second Amendment. Leave with an understanding of respect for culture. Leave with an understanding of conflict resolution and firearm safety. We want to be able to do that for whoever comes to whatever city for free. We do that by you men and women deciding to say, this is important. I'm going to pay it forward with a donation. Okay? Um, And doing so, to do that, GoFundMe.com forward slash Black Guns Matter. That's one way that everyone can help. The other way is if you do want to be a more visible supporter, and have that conversation with more people, even in your demographic. Our merch is a tremendous conversation start. Yeah. Go to blackgunsmatter.myshopify.com, get a shirt. Either way, these are ways that we can finance. As great as this work is that we're doing, and I love the work, I've committed my life to this. As much as this awesome as this is, airlines and hotels do not care. <laughs> so this stuff is not, just because we're giving the class free. <laughs> Don't mean that they're going to go, you know what, Maj, you're such a great guy. Right. Here's first class yeah. everywhere. <laughs> you know, so this is a way that we can use you guys' support. We only have, we only have a little bit over uh, maybe twenty eighteen thousand dollars $18,000 left uh, to raise for the entire year wow. of 2019. The quickest, we, the quicker we can get out, that out of the way, the quicker I can do, add another thing to our plate, which is I am running for city council in philadelphia nice um and that because it's one thing about informing the people but we also got to have um, people in positions uh especially in local politics to uh to support the work and protect our freedoms and that's I, i'm willing to you know 
be a public servant in that regard. And if you want to support there, it's maj4philly.com, maj4philly.com. So those are the three areas. GoFundMe.com forward slash Black Guns Matter for the GoFundMe classes for Black Guns Matter. The merch is BlackGunsMatter.MyShopify.com. And to get more information about the city council run, Maj4Philly.com. And I'll make sure our, our, uh, one of our producers, Richard Spars, that actually booked this guest for us, we'll put all that on our Facebook as well. And I'll tell you all, it, it, this work's being done is absolutely necessary. I would even go so far to say that it's vital. It is absolutely vital. I mean, very often, sir, it seems like a person can find themselves in a terrible situation due to nothing more than just lack of information. I mean, I've heard stories before about, about say, someone in Philly. You've told these stories about someone in Philly wanting to carry and just not understanding that it takes 20 minutes and a couple dollars to file for a concealed carry or even whatever the carry might be, right? But if Exactly. You could, if you could also t tell our audience either about that situation or some of these impromptu firearms uh, training courses that you do as well. Yeah, so we do some of them. You know, some cities like Detroit don't have gun ranges within the city limits, like literally none. Um, their politicians uh, have, have uh, been successful in making sure that their freedoms are very restricted. So what we do in that scenario is we go right where it is, um, uh, you know, where the people are. We take cert pistols which is called self-indicating resetting trigger pistols. We go out there, we do right in the middle of the community, right outside. We do uh, classes on proper handling, proper manipulation of firearms, um, stance, grip, side alignment, right there. Hmm. So in some spaces, in a good, on a good sunny day, we might just pull up with water, talk to the people, l give them literature on how they can get uh, firearm safety, and we show them right there on the spot. When you have, you know, what we've raised, you know, a hundred and however many eighty thousand dollars over the last few years that we gave away to do the work, we gave it all away. With that being the case, when you have less, you have to figure out how to do more with less. Mm -hmm. So I, we can put this information in the people's minds of all racial backgrounds, all ethnic, all Americans. We can put that information in their mind without a classroom. That's a, that's a net overall win for us. That's a win for those people. That's a win for. Americans in general, and that person can no longer be tricked by ideologies that tell them that they're not supposed to be able to defend their yes. rights. Yes, yes. You know? That's the t I mean, look, and I hate to ask this follow-up question uh, regarding these impromptu firearm safety courses. Do I hate to ask this follow-up question because I feel like I'd already know the answer B based upon look uh, what's been given in the way the media covers some of these topics. All right, you would expect to have major complications either with officers or anti-protesters, but that's not exactly correct, is it? No. We don't, you know, so one, we, a lot of times, the, the community is with us. The community's like, man, we didn't even know that this existed. We needed this, and it's free. That's one. So that's that. The other thing, like the anti, the Antifa, the whoever, first of all, we in the hood, and they never really come to the hood. That's one. Two, a lot of us that's in the class is a strap, and we not really playing that. So we don't get anti-protesters. So many law enforcement officers are like, thank you so much. So many law enforcement officers. We've had more law enforcement officers call out corrupt officers because of this than I've seen in my lifetime. So nice. We are, we are, you know what I mean? So these are things that, you know, if you're a bad cop, you're a bad cop. You shouldn't be a cop in the first place. But those officers that are out there chasing robbers, rapists, and, 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 and murderers, those guys and women are with us. So we don't get pushback. If anything, at a certain level, we may get pushback from some people that are politicians that have a vested interest in keeping the general public unaware. We don't even try to change that politician's mind. We're going to change the demographic's mind. And that politician's going to go with the tide. That's just what it is. You know, they're interested in votes. So if we change the hearts and minds of the people, that's why we don't get anti-gun protesters, anti-freedom protesters, because the general public are in alignment with freedom. Truth and freedom resonate. Because we are freedom people and we speak the truth, the community resonates with and you know this as well as I do, and the politicians and the officers know this also. The people that are out there committing crimes are not the lawful gun owners. That is the statistical, nope. factually accurate statement, yeah? Correct, correct. If I'm the bad guy, the reason why you, you have more gun violence and more violent crime in areas where there's more gun control is because if I'm the bad guy, all that means is I'm a bully, I'm a, I'm a Goliath, and there's no Davids around. There's nobody with slingshot. That's all that means. If I'm the bad guy, I don't care about the rules. However, if we start informing some of these young men and women before they become bad guys and women, we keep them in position, we turn those guys and, and women in from potential bad guys to potential patriots. Yes. Because we're giving them that empowerment. We're yes. giving them that education.
You know? I'm loving it, man. Listen, I, my, my producer, Roz, wants to ask you a question. I have a few more questions. Is there any way we can hold you through one more break and do at least one more sure. segment? I'm here. Well, oh, it was just here. a quick comment. And before oh, yeah. Adrian, Adrian Filibuster actually just called in and asked if you could run for president. <laughs> If that's possible. <laughs> He's running for council. So, so, Adrian, I'll, I'll say this, Adrian. If I get this city council seat, it's looking real good for me to run for the mayor of Philadelphia yes. in about four or five years. Woo! If I can get Philadelphia, I can get anything after that. I'm loving it, Mosh. We'll put you back on hold. There goes Mosh Trey. Put him on hold here in just a second, 833 right now. Be back with some uh, a few more questions. I tell, I'll tell you one more time. I told the Rinders out in Taraz before. Uh, one of the best interviews we're going to have in a while. Be right back. Mosh for president, man. Man, I just love it when people can coalesce and fall and be harmonious with each other by way of nothing more than just logical premises, right? I mean, we're not talking right now because him and I both or even our audience is, guns, 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 you're American. It's not, no, it's not that, man. It's, it's liberty, individualism. It's like-minded philosophy. Just so goddamn beautiful to see. But I lacked the political education in my younger years to kind of like give it a scope and a, and a, a shapeable, translatable, scalable way of saying that to people and giving them an understanding of that frame. Uh, what do you, I mean, let's talk a little bit about why you're saying there's a history of gun laws being used to keep people of color, uh, helpless, yeah. effectively. Yeah. I mean, what were some of the big moments in that, uh, history? So we could go all the way back to, you know, Virginia. That's a hot topic right now. Yeah. Uh, we can go back to Virginia where the first anti, you know, freedom laws were created. Right after emancipation, you have black people that fought with and assisted with, you know, cool white people that were abolitionists that fought for the liberation. Uh, black people have fought in every major war in America, period. Even when we were like, hey, you guys are slaves, people escaped the fight against, yeah. you know, enslavement. Um, but right after, you know, emancipation, which doesn't mean free, it just means tra transfer of ownership, whole other topic. But right after that, they were like, hey, it's a lot of black people. We were kind of like beating them up for a minute. We don't know who want those guys to have the guns. Um, so they used that construct, that racial construct, to come up with rules. Even though you're saying that these people are now equal citizens, um, you came up with ways to stop people. At a certain point, all of America was constitutional carry, except for black people, except, except for you know the native, natives to this land, that, you know the uh, Aboriginal people, uh, you know indigenous people to this, you know what they call Turtle Island or whatever. So you know that's that's the history, and I'm not saying we gotta stay here. But at the, well, fun. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> that ain't going to happen. Right. Um, but at the same time, we got to get past the point of where we're pretending like this ain't where this came from. You know, and, or, and if you fast forward, you know, the, the Gun Control Act, you know, right? Oh, we got to stop these Italian mobsters in Chicago. These guys are bad for the fabric of America. Oh, yeah. We need gun control. Right? That happened right after the St. Valentine's Day massacre. The crazy Italians. You know what I mean? Those troublesome natives. Those, we don't know about those crazy uh, alcoholic Irish. Yeah, they've used every single racial background uh, to push more and more uh, anti-freedom, uh, non-justice, uh, anti-human policy. You know, uh, agenda. Who do you get the most pushback from in your work? Um, I get the most pushback from the gun community. Okay. But is it more white people or is it more black people? Or is it how do white people push back at you and how do black people push back at you? White people that have a background in law enforcement tend to give me the pushback. Oof. Not because we're anti-gun. They're like, yeah, you arming the hood, you just get them to do it right, safely, responsibly. They have difficulty with understanding the concept that if we're calling this a human right, and if someone goes to jail for robbing a bank, let's say an extreme thing, murder, they do think you got 30 years in jail, you do 30 years in jail, if this is a human right, they've paid their debt to society. Why are we not saying that this human doesn't get if they've changed, right? They've done what you said they have to do, or they paid their penance. Law enforcement gets nervous that I say that person should have the right to defend their life, and there should be no restrictions on that person. If he's still the bad guy, the Hannibal Lecter, rip your face off dude, he shouldn't be on the streets. There's that line, I'm an anarchist, so I'm, I'm very 
much, let's reduce the prison population as much as possible, if not for nothing. Yeah. And line is, don't let someone out of jail. You know, someone who, don't put someone in jail if you ever want to let them out. Right. And the thing is, if you're out, because it becomes, okay, it's a thing of, it's, it's three things. Did you rob somebody, take their stuff? Did you violate somebody's physical body? Or did you violate their property? Property issues, we can holler at in court, we can come up with, you know what I mean, we move forward. Um, violating somebody's body, you know, and things of that, or taking their stuff, you still go to court, but if you violate it to a point where there's, a, there's an actual crime, okay, you pay your penance. Law enforcement is afraid of accepting the fact that, yo, everybody that went to jail isn't the bad guy. How do you do this doing football numbers for weed? Right. And so it's like, that's where law enforcement we have, and I have hella support from high level trainers that have background in law enforcement. Some of them have a more freedom and open minded thought process. Some of them are like, I don't know, Marge. You know what I'm saying? So, but that's semi pushback. The other people that we get um, some of that from is the people that have, that are very aware of what I'm saying is true. They have an agenda, and unfortunately, my, my Democrat friends will get mad at this. Unfortunately, they happen to fall on the left. They're in positions, political positions of power in urban areas, you know, where they're pushing an agenda, and they're very well aware that this is a racist practice. They're very well aware of it, but they get the. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Real News. My name is Mr. Henry. Let's go right back now to our guest online, uh, Maz Ture, founder of Black Guns Matters. Let me ask you here, sir, switching uh, around a little bit. Uh, with people like uh, former Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens uh, uh, basically advocating uh, in the New York Times through an op-ed for the position of the total repeal and replacement of the Second Amendment, this has become one of the most polarizing issues of our time. Uh, do you see this in any way as a Democrat-Republican issue, or, or do you see this something a little bit bigger than that? Is both. I think that the people that want Americans to be armed, again, this is a conspiracy. It's not a theory. I think those small sections of people that want to control the American people, I think they'll use whichever uh, party is uh, willing to sell the American people out and violate, you know, the Constitution, violate their human rights. So, for example, <clears throat> you know, the Republicans are still pushing for extreme risk protection orders and red flag laws, which are direct violations of the Fourth Amendment you know, uh, ignoring due process. And a lot of Republicans are calling for that. The Democrats have been calling for it. The Democrats started the Ku Klux Klan. You know what I'm saying? So I think on one level, it has been a more left-leaning issue for some time. But I think that um, quite similar to how some people that have corporations have become really rich and jump into public service to change policy to benefit their, them and their friends and then jump back into the private sector, I think certain portions, that 1% of people, that want all Americans to be disarmed, right? Because we're the only place left. We're the only place that has a certain level of freedom, right? With that being the case, I think that just like they jump from the private to public sector, I think they jump from Democrat to Republican whenever it's convenient. You mm. know what I'm saying? I don't see, I don't see them uh, being trapped, and that's actually smart. First and foremost, even George Washington didn't want a two-party system for this exact reason. At a certain point, you have people thinking about their party over what's good for the overall republic, for the nation, for the people. You know, the Constitution starts with three simple words. We, the people. Yes. Not us on the right or us on the left. Not what it is. So I think that this, this has a, they'll use whichever um, willing vessel will be allowed, uh, uh, will allow themselves to be used, because those people make themselves exempt from the rules. Those politicians that push those bills that are handed to them, they're exempt from it. Oh. You know, the reason why the reason why some law enforcement go along with it because, you know, the Fraternal Order of Police, that union says, well, we're not going to be subject to that. So, OK, maybe. And that's not what America, the, the ideals that America is founded on. So, yeah, I think it's a party thing, whichever um, party can be used to get that um, de arm agenda happening and to try to turn, you know, in essence, you know, I'm paraphrasing a bit. But in essence, they're trying to turn America into communist China or we see what's happening in Venezuela right now. 
you know, and that's, that ain't going to really happen on my watch. I, that's all I could really say about it. Man, let me let me say, you, you strike me as, as like essentially in a modern day political or philosophical anomaly. Someone that's actively fighting against these social constructs that you have been told probably your entire life you must abide by. Do you ever get caught up in or frustrated by this groupthink mentality of either certain parties or ideologies forcing people to become completely dependent on that party and ide- ideology? Do you ever want, I guess what I'm asking this, you ever want to walk up to someone on the street and just shake them and scream to them, get out of the cave, follow me into reality? Yeah, man. So Harriet Tubman is one of my heroes because she didn't, I don't care about none of that. I know that we're enslaved. The problem with that, then you could see I'm in chains, I can't leave, I get whipped, so forth and so on. The mentality, the slave mentality of the mind is a much more thing because, you know, to a caged bird, you know, flying looks like a disease, you know? So it's like, now it's like, I, I, I kind of want to, you know, shake people at times, but over time, I've seen how letting time and information and sharing, you know, um, that influences people a whole lot more. There's a story that I read, like, when I was, like, little, and it was the sun and it was the wind. And they, the wind came up to the sun and said, I bet you I can make that guy take his coat off before you can. And the sun was like, Maybe you can, but okay. So the sun, I mean, the wind blew and blew and blew and blew and blew. And the guy, like, held his coat tighter as the wind blew harder and harder. And the wind said, man, there's no way you're going to be able to do it. I gave it my all. And all, the sun said, okay, my turn. And all the sun did was just shine and smile. Hmm. And the temperature went up, and the guy took his coat off on his own volition, not a mandate. Just the, the shining and being who the sun is. Made the guy go, man, it's hot out here. Let me take my coat off and let me enjoy the sun. We found more of an approach, even in dealing with anti-gun people. I know that you are missing information, and certain people have blown you into this matrix. Mm. We're just going to keep living life and showing the truth of the matter. On top of that, time is going to happen. You're going to maybe get, and I don't wish this on anybody, but you get robbed at gunpoint one time, and I guarantee you you're going to be hitting my Instagram DM asking Ooh. me questions. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the truth. You just said it, though. Some of our politicians, right, I hear, I mean, are elected, are elected politicians that are allegedly in charge of running this country. I've heard them describe firearms in the sense of these firearms have a capacity of a fully semi-automatic clip. Now, anyone that follows gun culture is laughing to themselves right now. (laughs) What what in the world is a fully semi-automatic clip? There's so many problems with that. If you could set this out on some spectrum of giving a percentage of how much of this do you think really comes from just simple, plain ignorance? I think that a lot of it comes from ignorance. I think that a lot of the – so ignorance is the the order of the day. If we can trick people and if we can – we understand that a lot of those politicians, some of them actually mean well. A lot of them actually. They're only looking at it from what they've been shared. they in that same matrix. So they've been told and they've been experiencing trauma based on the ignorance around firearms. Of course they would go, man, they only identify it with the tool. They don't know that there was an idiot surrounded by ignorance and no knowledge. So the first step is, man, my constituents have experienced pain, the loss of life, injury, so forth and so on. Some of them are coming from that perspective. Those politicians, when they're open and objective to the data and the conversation and the facts of the matter, which is 16 constitutional carry states with very low uh, gun control measures, notoriously lower violent crime. That's a fact. That's not my feeling. You go to the other places that have high gun control, they also have more of that trauma. Those uh, politicians that are open to hearing that, information changes, the facts change your feeling. The smaller amount of politicians that are in the pocket of that 1% that want to make America the Bloomberg, that want to make Americans malleable, soft, marshmallow. I call them marshmallows because they're easy to grab and easy to chew. <laughs> you can't do that with a, a bag of nails. That's right. We got to be hard as nails. Those small percentages of those politicians that are, that are aware of finance by 1% of the population that want to influence our public servants to get us to agree to our own detriment. So Hmm. the vast majority of it is ignorant, a small minority, which is very powerful. They're very well organized, they're very well funded, and they are very well educated. The small amount of those politicians 
have a lot of power. And that's how we keep seeing that. So for us, it's very important to make sure that everyone is supporting the work and we help and inform people from the ground up. So you can't trick constituents anymore. Mm. They go from the they go from the top, from the elite down. We work from the people and shift that culture from the bottom up. That's a right. That's absolutely right. And which one's more powerful at the end of the day? I'll let y'all answer for yourself. Uh, joined by Maj Torre, founder of Black Guns Matters. Uh, about one more minute before this last break, see if we can keep uh, Maj for one more segment. On the way out here, uh, sir, could you one more time tell our audience members, and again, I'll put it on Facebook and all our social media platforms for everyone to follow up on later, but one more time tell our audience members the three areas that they can really help y'all out in. So the three areas, again, y'all, for the classes themselves, to keep these classes free, please, everyone listen. Please donate to our GoFundMe. We keep these. We spent all of the money. We raised about one hundred and eighty something thousand dollars. We spent it all on educating the people over the last two years. Every dime of it. GoFundMe.com forward slash Black Guns Matter. The quicker we get that that out of the way, that remaining whatever you know twenty something thousand dollars, whatever that is, the quicker we get that out of the way, um, the quicker we can focus on the next phase of fundraising, which we can do simultaneously, which is. Uh, I'm running for city council in Philadelphia. If you want to donate to that, Maj for Philly, M A J F O. Please donate to that. The maximum individual donor can be six thousand dollars. If you got a pack, it can be twenty-three thousand dollars. I'm up against seven Goliaths in Philly. Wow. Developers that are really rich. Um, and you can get some merch if you want to be more open about your support of the Second Amendment. BlackGunsMatter.myShopify.com. Buy a couple of t-shirts. Make the hood great again. Black Guns Matter, all of those different things. Those are the three areas where people all across the world can help our cause out. And because, uh, we, again, we're up against very well-organized, very well-funded uh, anti-freedom people. Mm. Maj, can you, do a, can you do one final segment with us? Absolutely. Awesome. Fantastic. When we come back, I want to ask Maj a little bit more about his race. I want to ask a little bit more about, uh, hey, man, can we get some more people involved in running for elected positions? Let's, let's turn this, this philosophy into true, legitimate action at the street level. 849, hit the spray. Be right back. All right. All right. I love doing this friggin' radio show, man. Probably do it for free if I had a way. <sighs> so much goddamn fun. Um, Chris, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure he does have support from the NRA. He's been on, on several, several NRA podcasts and, and talk shows before, so I assume he, he has it. of local, state, and federal policy on your property and how these political decisions affect you personally and the value of your property. IPR Radio, the intersection of politics and real estate, Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. exclusively on Talk. Chris, um, he kind of answered that question at the very beginning of the interview. It wasn't specifically pertaining to the NRA, but I, I asked him, because I've heard him answer this in other interviews, I asked him, did, what does he think... Uh, are, are conservatives, and by conservatives I meant Republicans and NRA. He knew what I meant because he's answered this before. Are conservatives doing enough to reaching out to, to urban communities? Now, he considers himself a conservative NRA person. He says no. NRA conservative Republicans are not doing enough to reach out to urban communities. Um, frankly speaking, I think my particular answer to that would be, well, it's kind of because we've been told it's not our place to do so, right? I mean, I know that's a, a rough thing to say, but he says, no, 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 man. The, the urban communities are not only ready to hear this type of message, they need to hear this type of message. Um, now, again, it's, it's arguably much more effective coming from a guy like Maz than it is from someone like me or, or anybody else. But uh, what I would say is the answer to that question, if the NRA um, uh, does much to reach out to black communities, I, I'd probably say his answer would be probably not, based upon the answer I asked him before. Home Improvement Radio Show. We want to welcome our newest sponsor, EastTennesseeExteriors.com. You can find them on Facebook, and they're the people you can trust. EastTennesseeExteriors.com, 865-357-4326, 865-357-4326. Whether it's roofing, siding, windows, and more great products at a fair price from a company you can trust. East Tennessee Exteriors, 865-357-4326. Mr. Electric of Knoxville can help you with 
home or business projects like installations, wiring, and electrical safety. Ask about the free home safety check. Go online now to MrElectric.com. Traffic from the FMT Insurance Studios of Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760. A little slow downtown. They had a wreck westbound west of Alcoa Highway. Still plenty of volume on Kingston Pike Interstate to the west. Should not be more than a single light cycle right now. Profounded City, Farragut, Rocky Hill, or Cumberland Estate. Stick with it. Blood Excavating needs highly experienced track hope and finished dozer operators. What a great opportunity, great pay, a career opportunity. Apply online at bluntexcavating.com. Have a great Wednesday. I'm Pete Michaels. Every hiring manager knows that a company is only as good as the people it's made from. So where do you find the best people? That may surprise you. Meet the grads of life, young adults of unique determination and experience, an ideal fit for your company in an entry-level position, internship, or even mentorship. They might not have every qualification you typically look for, but they're exactly who your company needs. This is talent worth knowing about. Go to gradsoflife.org to learn how to find, cultivate, and train this great pool of untapped talent. Brought to you by the Ad Council and gradsoflife.org. Hi, this is John Adams. You know when you get streaming numbers that are through the roof, you have the phone banks lit up during our local phone calls, emails and telephone calls that come into the station. You know you must be doing something right. Thank you so much for allowing Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760 WETR to be your talk you can trust. The views and opinions heard on the programs which air on Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760 are those of the hosts and guests of those programs and not necessarily those of the station or management. <laughs> see, see what you've done, Roz? See what you've done? This is your fault. You did this. I hope you learn to make it on your Just know you'll never be alone. I hope that you get it. I hope that it's the realest thing that you ever know. Ain't million dollar cribs have a million dollar dream. Change the world. Welcome back to Real News, ladies and gentlemen. Going back to our guest online right now, Maj Torre, founder of Black Guns Matters. And Maj, we had this uh, this listener call in named Adrian before and, and asked Roz the question of would you be willing to run for president of the United States? And, and I'll speak on his behalf and say, look, there's always a sense of sincerity to everyone's sarc Slightly facetious. Right, you you strike me, man, as the kind of guy that's sort of like a political Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. You, you hear what I'm saying? When yeah, you're talking, absolutely. Talking about your city council run, was this something that the people asked you to go towards? Did you feel like a calling from the community placed on you, or have you always sort of thought about this? So, um, even if you don't have an interest in politics, politics is definitely going to take an interest in you. Mm. Um, and so, for me, it was like having these conversations, and then. You know, across the country, seeing more and more, you know, again, local government. I think we focus so much on the national elections, 2020, 2016, 2024, that we forget how much power we have in local politics before it even gets up to a national level. I think that we also um, sometimes forget about states' rights because we talk about the federal government so much. Um, and it shouldn't be that way. I'm, I'm a fan of decentralization. but I'm a fan of systems of checks and balances. And one of the best ways to do that is to, like, actually be a part of that. Now, with that being the case, it would be wrong if I became a part of that and then I started to become started to become an actual politician, like in how it's, the term is used now, as opposed to a, a public servant. So, and seeing all these different cities, like man, we're making all this great way, but the politicians have an ability to just with a swoop of a pen, you know, now make pe uh, however many hundreds of thousands of people of uh, thousands of people felons, you know, that right. just want to have 16 rounds instead of 10. So with that being the case, it's like, okay, if they mass media at on certain levels and, uh, you know, politicians will try to act like they don't see us. But if I'm in that seat, you have to contend with me because I'm right next to you. Yes. You know, and if the people want that, the people will get out, they'll support, they'll make donations, we'll be able to get campaign don contributions, and I'll be in that seat. And my goal is when I get in there or what I have to do is to not change. I have to remember that I am not a politician. I am a Philadelphian. Mm. I am an American. That's what's happening there. So what happened was everybody just started going. Like everybody says, man, you should run for some sort of office. And, and having highly political friends, politics is grimier than me being outside selling drugs. <laughs> That's the the only difference is 
The only difference is nobody shoots you. That's the <laughs> only difference. They just sue you. You know right, what I mean? Right. And so it's like, man, do I want to do this? But yes, because then it becomes, you know, win, lose, or draw. I got to put my money where my mouth at. If I'm, I'm building a constituency and a national fan base, I also can't neglect my hood. I am from Philly. And then that'll start a domino effect, a chain of events that gets other Second Amendment advocates, as well as other freedom women, other freedom men, to be involved in their city's local politics. Mm. A good buddy of mine, and, a, and actually a personal hero that's alive, is Rep. Thomas Massey. You know, he started very local. You know, he's one of the most principled politicians that we have in United States Congress. And I have to respect that. He was from a small town in Kentucky. There's a great documentary on him. We did an Instagram live together. He lives off the grid. He does all of these great things as a United States congressman. And it's like, man, if he can be principled in the cesspool that has become D.C. politics, I know being a Philadelphia dude, I can get in there and shake some things up and do a positive as well. Mm, so that's kind of like where life took me. Um, and we'll see what happens. I, 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 only, I only need like 20,000 votes to win. That's all I need. Mm. You know, because I'm running, obviously, I'm running as a libertarian. I'm not, I'm not running as a Democrat or a Republican. Again, you get know, joined so by, uh, to... by Maz Ture this morning, uh, Black Guns Matters. Unfortunately, sir, we have to end the segment here. I cannot uh, seriously thank you enough for... Uh, you for... rock! <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> for giving us some of your time. I'll put all the information out on our Facebook and repeat it again after this break one more time. Uh, thank you so much again, sir. We'll, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you all. Talk to you all in a bit. There goes uh, Maz Ture, 858, going to get Graz to cut that entire thing up so we can put it out solo on all of our, uh, all of our information later on. Hit this break, news traffic, weather, all that. Be right back. God is all good, the devil is so real. So listen up, y'all, because this is how I feel. I won't back up, I don't back down. I've been raised up to stand my ground. Take my job, but not my guns. Tax my chance. All right, good stuff, y'all. What am I going to leave y'all with? Joe Biden hasn't even been running for president for one full week yet, but he already sounds like he's out of gas. There he is in Iowa just yesterday. He's making my point with a huge tax cut. You got twice as many corporations making billions of paying no taxes at all. I mean, no, no, but I mean, think of, I mean, it's not about, I, I know you're supporting by saying, but look, here's the deal. It's just simply not right. I'm not the only one who noticed he's been slurring his words over the last few days, and I don't mean any disrespect, but that could be a big sign that he's just too old for this. If he wins, he would be the oldest president ever to take office at the age of 77. What about you? If he Joe Biden hasn't even been running for president for one full week yet, but he already sounds like he's out of gas. There he is in Iowa just yesterday. Just think about what with this new tax cut. You got twice as many corporations making billions of paying no taxes at all. Senator Joe, I mean, no, no, but I mean, think about, I mean, it's not about, I, I know you're supporting by saying bully, but look, here's the deal. It's just simply not right. Hey, I'm not the only one who noticed he's been slurring his words over the last few days, and I don't mean any disrespect, but no. that could be a big sign they, that yeah. he's okay. just too old for this. Really? If he wins, he would be the oldest president ever to take office at the age of 77. Oh, what about uh, you, Mr. Trump? You're getting pretty old, too. Well, I think I'll that uh, I okay. just feel like a young man. <laughs> I'm so young. I can't believe it. I'm the youngest person. I am a young, vibrant man. I look at Joe. I don't know about him. I don't know. He's too old. I would uh, never say anyone's too old. Plus, but poor Joe has such low energy, he couldn't even come up with an original campaign slogan. The president has a motto. Make America great again. Do you have one? Make America moral again. Make America return to the yeah, essence of where we are. The dignity of the country, the dignity of people, We're treating our people with dignity. And this god awful deliberate division is being yes. taken to in order to separating people to aggrandize his own power. That make America great. return to the essence the of who we are, huh? That sounds like making us great again.
With the economy doing so well, it's unclear what Joe Biden's platform is even going to be, unless he joins the rest of his comrades and promises to just start giving everything away for free. What would you say to the Trump voter, the Trump supporter, who looks at the economy and sees very strong numbers here in Pennsylvania, where the unemployment is at a record low of 3.9 percent? Well, what I'd say is, did you get any benefit from the tax cut? Has your, really, has your wages really gone up to everything you deserve? Do your employers treat you with any more respect and dignity than they did before? What's the story? Ask these folks. Ask the folks in this state. I know the state pretty well. And the fact of the matter is that they're not getting their fair share. Thank you for asking, sir. My boss treats me like crap. He doesn't bring me milk and cookies. He gets upset when I leave for lunch early, and when I come back late, and when I get caught sleeping in my car in the parking lot when I'm supposed to be on shift. He's a real jerk. Now it's President Trump's fault that people's bosses don't treat them with the kind of respect that they want. Even Joy Blowhard and the other creatures on The View admit that the economy is doing fantastic. The other thing about the economy is interesting is that Trump's numbers never seem to go past 38, 39 percent. And with an economy like this, he should be it's, in the 70s. I think it's, it's 37 It's bizarrely now. historical in that sense. And any other president would have been up there. It would have been. Yeah. This would be a persona non grata because the economy is on fire. That's why the numbers Clinton did so well. It is something he promised and he had yeah. achieved. Well, one of the reasons his approval numbers aren't the greatest is probably because he He's been bombarded by fake news 24-7 for two and a half years about just how terrible he is. The other reason could be that maybe the polls just aren't accurate. Remember these from just a few weeks before the 2016 election? The Washington Cup Post said that Donald Trump's chances of winning are approaching zero. CNBC reported that a Trump victory was all but impossible based off of previous races. And let's not forget the New York Times gave Hillary Clinton a... 91% chance of winning. Speaking of the polls, they're all showing that Joe Biden is beating the rest of his Democrats, followed by breadline Bernie Sanders, Beta O'Rourke, Captain Planet, and Pete Buttigieg. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you have Congressman Eric Swall as well, who was polling at 0%. You just keep it up, Eric, because we love watching you make a fool of yourself on cable news. And speaking of cable, Adam Schiff for Brains is on Bill Maher's show and once again admitted that it's going to be impossible to impeach the president. But since it's HBO, he decided to try to sound really tough. Um, at the end of the day, Bill, there's only one way to deal with this problem, whether we impeach him or not, and that is to vote his ass out of office. I... I I do think that, uh, th th I also think that... Look at how cool he thinks he is. I just swore on TV because it's HBO. No, sir, you are just a loser. But thank you for being the inspiration behind my One Russian star. bot shirt. Order yours from my online store at MarkDice.com or pick the link in the description below. And, of course, they're available to teach shirt long sleeve and a hoodie. And a whole bunch of different colors as well. Or if that's not your style, pick up a new I Love Global Warming shirt. Or the new Trump Thug Life t-shirts. All of them are available at markdice.com. So head on over and click the link in the description below and check them out. Hey, Mars is good, isn't he? Huh? Yeah, he's great. I've, I've been following him for a little while, and uh, it's uh, yeah. I I like that. Uh, um. By the way, um, y'all probably y'all probably realize this, but yeah, it seems like a good one. At least Mike's super one directional. Don't feel bad about getting fun of him at all. Um, honestly, what I'd like to do is sort of just, as much as we can, a repeat of a lot of our conversation before. Obviously, what, what I'm going to start with is get y'all to introduce yourselves, and probably the first full segment we'll talk about what the show is, when the time is, things like that. Just get to introduce the, the concept behind it, and then move a bit more into the um, sort of the details behind what it is for the overlap of, of politics and, and realty. Um, uh, and then if we get callers on it, which I assume we might, um, you know, some of the issues with the recode stuff will probably come up. Um, anyways, just free, you know. Grant, we'll fall, um, everything I do is from stream of consciousness. <laughs> right. 
So, <laughs> so if I'm not led, there's not. Uh, <laughs> if somebody's not helping me uh, bait the hook, I'm not fishing. But, hey, but fishing for the stream of consciousness is something I can do. And Kelvin, if you don't want to bring this up, I, by all means, I totally understand. But would you would you feel comfortable going into at least explaining? Hey, I used to do radio stuff in the past. This is where you might know me from, type thing. You're such a modest guy. I've had other people. I was talking to Richard the other day. He's like, yeah, he probably didn't tell you, but he was, and then he went off with this whole diatribe of what he's got up on. I'm like, he didn't tell me any of that stuff. So, so, <laughs> so I, I'm telling you, the reason that I'm doing this show is because of Kelvin. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> what Richard said too. He's like, Kelvin obviously knows how to lead the stuff, but uh, uh, but if we would you feel comfortable at all bringing this? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, okay. all right, cool. What's, what's the call letters here? W R J Z. W E T R. Yeah, okay. you can say R J Z though. I think that's somebody else. I'll take credit for it. <laughs> 92.2. And your 760 is on, on Bell in the Dust? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 760, 92.3 is. Um, and, and where? Oh, both of them are Bell in the Dust? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Dude, don't quote me on that, man. I know the FM is for sure. Um, the AM? Typically they are. Yeah, I know we have programs that does that long. I don't know how how it works. Got least space for the right clear channel space. Yeah, yeah. Your headset's audio technica. Yeah, yeah. The uh, what the image fifties. Yeah, I was just I was telling Kevin I was just pointing those out. But uh, the best uh, headset this year for uh, podcasting. Yeah, right? are they? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're as far as I understood, as far as cost effectiveness goes, they're about the best in the industry. I can find. It's not a you know a two thousand dollar pair of Costec headphones or something, right? But. Uh, the um, I was going to get those Bose uh, Ultra Comfort that you use for um, using for take cell phone calls, do everything. Yeah, yeah. But they're like two and a half times as much. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You pay for the name brand sometimes, but all right, let's do this. Come on. Oh my goodness, what a. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Real News, broadcasting live from the FMT and Sharon Studios. My name is Mr. Henry. Uh, hey, by the way, if you're looking for a job, fantastic news for you. Eastwood Landscaping, they're looking for motivated crew members willing to pay compensation of $11 to $15 per hour. Uh, now, you can go online at eastwoodlandscaping.com or just apply in person at 5547 Washington Pike, Monday through Thursday. That's 5547 Washington Pike. They're voted best in landscaping. They also do the uh, the landscaping for the palatial estate that is the FMT Insurance Studios. Uh, one time more, big shout-out to Maj Ture. I'm going to make sure uh, Richard Esparza, producer here, one of the producers on the show, if you're listening to us, go ahead and throw out all that information, Twitter, Facebook, um, the GoFundMe page, all the stuff. Uh, Maj Ture, again, we're going to throw out his stuff on our Facebook link as well. What are you laughing at me about? What did I say, Ross? I'm laughing at Kelvin oh, when he uh, said palatial estate. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know. They don't know. They don't know where we are. <laughs> could be a I didn't realize estate. how I reacted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your face said it all. That was great. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Anyways, he's also running for city council up in Philadelphia. Maz Therese. We'll, uh, we'll throw out all that stuff. Uh, big thanks for him for joining us for that whole hour. He's a phenomenal, phenomenal guy to, to listen to. Speak with and oh, listen to any guy is incredible, and I, and I like that. He, obviously, he's pushing Black Guns Matters, but it's much bigger than that. How much would you pay to see him in a debate with Kamala Harris? Oh man, I'd pay to see him in a debate with Cortez, Harris, Tlaib, any of those folks. It'd be good. It'd be incredible. It'd be absolutely incredible, man. And uh, by the way, some of these voices you're hearing around the studio. Let's start uh, to my right here, and then we'll go forward. Uh, new program is starting this Saturday. Let's go ahead and int introduce the host of this program with Kelvin first. Go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Yep, Victor's the host. Oh, okay. Well, Victor's the host. Victor, you introduce yourself first. <laughs> See that dubious distinction? Neither one of us want to be the host. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's no problem. Yeah. Uh, my name's Victor Jernigan. I've uh, been in the real estate business in the, the Knoxville market and East Tennessee and the Southeast uh, for over 45 years. Hmm. I've been uh, in all facets of the real estate industry, and I'm involved in a group uh, locally, the Knoxville Real Estate Investor Association, Knoxria, and you can go to our website, knoxria.com. And the, top, the, the taglines, the value proposition for that group is serious information about real estate, actionable information for active investors. And what turns out to be really something that I've seen over the decades that I've been involved in real estate is that the... Uh, the direct link between political action and real estate values gets lost on the general population. 
even the most active investors in the Knoxville market really miss how uh, a zoning action or inaction will impact their property values over the next three to five to 20 years. So when an investor buys a property, buys a house on a street, they're making a decision to take their private capital and invest their money in that house. When they do that, that will change that street for at least 10 years and probably 20 years. Mm. If you have two or three investors who are all thinking in terms of the long-term value, then they invest in that same neighborhood. It changes the neighborhood. And when you begin to change neighborhoods, you change communities. And so what happens for those investors who are taking their private capital, they miss many times the direct impact that government action is going to have on those investments. They falsely rely on comparable values, which are talked about all the time. There's two radio shows that are uh, on Saturday morning that we're in between. We're at 10 o'clock on Saturday morning, and uh, at earlier is um, Rick's house where he's talking about how to repair houses, how to fix houses, how to not overbuild your house, right? Mm. And then Ryan Coleman comes on talking about uh, one of the best agents in Knoxville for sure, and he's talking about market value, where things are, right? The, the reality Every person is an investor in real estate. They don't know it. They may be renting, and they don't think of themselves as an investor in real estate, but they are taking their rent money and paying for the property that they're living in. It's just owned by somebody else. If you, are, if you buy a house in today's world, you are just renting from a bank. You are renting from the federal government. You, you think you own the house, but in reality, you're just renting it because if you don't make the payments, if you're renting somewhere, they evict you. If you don't make the payments uh, to the government or to the bank that owns your house, they evict you. Yeah. You have exactly the same issues. It's just a question of what are the qualifications to get to either one. And that uh, that show is entitled IPR, obviously dealing with the intersection between politics and real estate. Other host of that show, uh, Kellen Moxley, go ahead and introduce yourself. Well, glad to be here. Thank you. Um, I, I am a co-host. Um, I don't have the uh, sort of real estate experience that uh, Victor has, but I do have, um, you know, modest amount of uh, political experience hmm. that, you know so i can kind of extreme bring, amount you know, well, <laughs> it's, it's modest you know, it's, um you know to uh, let me take a moment to you know, let me just establish my bona fides on, on politics <laughs> um i um uh got my basically got my start in politics as a um uh, a, a uh, political writer for a small town newspaper back home in in lebanon tennessee and uh, got my bachelor's in political science at UT. Uh, uh, then um, went to work for a DOD. And, you know, after that, I had a small business. And uh, then I went to, uh, uh, came back here to Knoxville for uh, graduate school, again, in political science. So uh, didn't finish my master's degree because, well, let me back up just a second. I ran for, I ran for a county commission in, back in Wilson County, unsuccessful, one of the many unsuccessful political campaigns that I, <laughs> that I <laughs> political offices I ran for. Um, uh, then, um, you know, went to UT uh, for graduate school in political science and uh, uh, started, helped start a small uh, conservative newspaper called the Conservative Spectator. So some of you, some of our former readers might uh, re remember that from back in the, in the, uh, in the uh, er early 90s. Uh, during that time, I um, got a chance to meet uh, Fred Thompson when he was running for um, uh, the Senate, U.S. Senate. Um, after doing an interview with him, he said, if Kelvin can be that tough on me, he can be that tough for me. And he took me to Washington with him. Nice. And uh, worked for him for uh, in uh, D.C. for four years and in Nashville for four years. Uh, basically, I was a policy analyst, uh, a legislative assistant. Uh, you know, you know those guys on uh, CNN, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. C-SPAN, who, yeah. who 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 sit along a w the wall in the back of the chambers or behind the uh, the um, uh, members. You always the, wonder what they're doing, what yeah, pull they have. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was kind of one of those guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. They're the real movers and shakers, though. Those are the, those are the real folks doing stuff in Washington, right? And then uh, after Fred retired, I came back to Knoxville. Knoxville's always been sort of a touchstone for me. No matter where I was, what I was doing, I always tried to figure out a way to wrangle my way back here. Um, and uh, came back here, started helped start a radio show, uh, The Voice, with, Lord, with late Lord, Lloyd Dougherty, uh, doing you know daily political talk. And uh, during that time, also uh, I ran for county clerk mm. unsuccessfully. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
And then, uh, well, let's see. Basically, uh, you know, when the, when the, uh, Lloyd passed away and the show kind of shut down, I, I went to work for the um, sheriff's office. And during that time, I uh, went to, to law school, got my uh, doctor of jurisprudence. Uh, so, yes, I, 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 but I am not a licensed attorney, and I do not play one on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> That's no problem. And, and uh, obviously what I'm going to get into here a little bit, I, I think it goes without saying that, that Kelvin's history on radio has had quite an impact on the local area. Uh, talk to people that are in the know if you don't know what I'm talking about. But let me bring this up real quick. I was asking Kelvin the other day, and I'll get Victor's take on this also, of what we're about to move into for this next segment, which should be pertinent to the Real News audience because there's only two publications apparently in this entire area that are covering the recode nonsense that's going on currently. I was asking uh, Buddy Kelvin the other day, all right, these two guys know far more about recode than I do, given their history of what he just explained, given Victor's history in real estate, what he just explained. I was asking these guys, what, uh, yesterday, two days ago was it? I think it was yesterday. Uh, in, in your assessment, if you had to take a poll right now and say what percentage of Knox Villains do you think actually know what recode is, what did you tell me? I, I think probably at the most 3%. Victor, you think he's about right on that? I, I, it's certainly under 5 Right. Uh, I mean, that's, if I was just picking an over-under number, I'd say four because it's going to be right in there. And uh, it's unbelievable the people who own real estate who have gotten the nice letter that they yeah. sent out, right? Very nice letter, yeah. who didn't think that they were going to be impacted because they already have a building on the property, right? Mm. They're already using their property for a commercial use. The What they didn't understand was how the use is going to change in the future if they wanted to do something else with their property. And that really gets to be the issue with Recode. The people in general do not understand the impact that zoning has on the value of their property and the government's actions as it relates to how they're going to enforce Recode well, going forward. Even if they wanted to have some knowledge of it, I would like to think, Victor, that uh, the, the story behind the scenes sort of of, of the, the, the notice being sent out, we would like to say on Real News we had something to do with that. because I think there was, had a lot to do with it. There was an ordinance passed at the 11th hour saying we don't have to give notice to anybody. We had Councilwoman Seema Singh Perez on the show saying, yeah, we're going to send out notices. We're not sure why, but then she was on record saying, as a sure enough, they had, to send, right. they had to send notices out. Either way, 919, got to hit this break, come back with some recode talk. I'm really going to get into the details of what these uh, both these guys think about recode. Uh, now, frankly speaking, I'm not going to try and make it partisan, which I don't think it is partisan. I think we're just trying to speak factually, correct? But right. uh, 919, we'll take your phone calls on this if you want to. 865 aaa talk 865-888-8255. More on all this to come. Oh, good stuff, man. You got enough degrees to hand around to people, man, huh? Yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> so, I mean, he, Kelvin always has really clear opinions about something that I'm saying. So he'll he'll call bullshit in a hurry. <laughs> All right. He's just he's just like uh, when I'm, he's just like um, my adult children. They'll do these. You know, they'll, they'll call bullshit quick. <laughs> have y'all have y'all been thought about? Have y'all been thought? Goodness gracious! Have y'all thought about doing something together for for a while? A week. A week. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was around the first of the year after I um, uh, after I bombed the bar exam. Okay. I got out of the hospital. Oh no! Yeah, <laughs> so you know, I was I was bitching and moaning on uh, on uh, uh, Facebook, and Victor saw it. We'd known each other for a while, and you know, he called me up and asked me, you know, you know, what are you doing? You know, you want to come help me out? And I said, yes, you know what? Hey, by the way, I've been wanting to do politics. I've been wanting to do real estate for a while. Not that it matters too much for our conversation. I tell politicians to do that. That camera, by the way. We don't have to. Usually when we go to commercial break, I turn their audio from the camera on so they can hear everything we're talking about right now, whoever's on Facebook, just, just full disclosure there. But, um, well, I think it's awesome, and I think it fits perfectly well with the way you described it, too. Rick South's talking about home improvement, right. and then sandwiched on the other end, talking about real estate, and then in between, it's a perfect transition of, okay, home improvement makes sense of the bigger picture than back in the reality. Ryan, dude, I see that guy everywhere. That guy is all over the place. Well, You've got to get listings to be able to make money. And, I mean, if you've got a buyer who's ready to buy and prepared to do what's necessary to do. Right? Mm -hmm. But the, the reality, though, is being able to get a listing. So what Clark talked about, Ryan, but there are probably 20 agents in town that are really good about coming up with a value for the property, mm -hmm. right, based on what, how they perceive the market to be. So uh, you hear stories all the time 
Uh, there, there were 70 offers on the I mean, Ryan was talking about a, a, a 70? house. 70? 70. Wow. 70 offers on a house that Ryan Coleman had a client that they were on the buy last week. So anyway, that agent that put that property out there didn't know what they were doing, right? Mm -hmm. There's no reason to put a property out there that's going to be, because you don't know where the price really right, is, right? right? It's just a question where people get tired of bidding, right? Right. And, and then more importantly, you have a whole group of people that don't even look at the property because it's priced too low for where they were looking to begin with. Oh, I hear you. Right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, you want, you're, you're looking for those agents. Uh, it's good to say that there's, you're going to you want to create demand with the price. But the reality is you've got to come up with a, in today's world where there's a limited amount of demand, understanding where that demand is growing at the price point is really critical. So mm -hmm. you, want, you, want that, you want those agents that are going to be representing you as the seller of the home to be able to identify a price in which there will be demand, but not crazy bidding wars. Sure. <laughs> Do you really? I'm for real one of my I friends. actually stole your phone during the break and <laughs> yeah. saw your playlist, and this was the, the number one well, on your playlist. You, if you actually did, this might be in the top <laughs> ten. Of my playlist song all the time. I love that stupid song. You're the voice. Goodness gracious! All right, let's get back into this here, uh, Victor Jernigan. Let me start with uh, getting your assessment, then I'll go to Kelvin over here. I tend to agree regarding Recode. I don't think Recode needs any any recap here with the Real News audience. I tend to agree with Steve Hundley over here at KnoxFocus.com. Uh, headline of this article is, it re is Recode supposed to be a secret? Here's, here's Steve Hundley's take. In my opinion, what Recode is about is raising property taxes under the illusion of doing a zoning overhaul. What Recode is really about is increasing population density to get more property taxes. What Recode is about is not letting the public know the truth. It's not just the city of Knoxville government that is attempting to keep Recode a secret. It's also the vast majority of local media. Grandpa's call number in line one. Hang on just for me, uh, for me for just a second and we'll get you screened. He finishes this article out by saying, why has the focus spent so much time on Recode? Because it's not about recode, it's about representation. The people of Knoxville are not being represented by their city council members. They are being dictated to. In East Tennessee, there's one thing you don't do in politics. You don't tell voters how it's going to be. That's kind of how I feel with it. How do you feel about the recode? Well, the, the, one of the issues with recode is that they're wanting planners' job is to plan. And they're looking to create a situation in which planners have more direct control over the way Knoxville is going to look. And in in theory, they create, they've created a matrix which says that if you have this kind of business, you can look and see which, where you're going to be it's, instead of having to look through the entire zoning code as it exists today. The issue gets to be recode has lots of issues that increase density, which are almost all being eliminated by the process. The other thing is that it has restrictions as to what the buildings are going to look like, and they're trying to limit those, so they're trying to get to a more aesthetic pleasing without having to require certain kinds of materials. Right. So these regulations increase the cost of whatever you're building, whether it's housing or commercial properties. The Removing the density opportunities creates a situation in which you're going to make Knoxville more aesthetically pleasing. By making it more aesthetically pleasing and limiting the amount of housing that's going to be here, with the growth that we're having, with the people that are moving here, we don't have a refugee population moving here. We have a wealthy population moving here mm. that are moving here for the jobs that are being created. And with a limited amount of housing in an aesthetically pleasing area, you're going to wind up with a situation that the people who live here today won't be living here in five to ten years. Mm. What is that new demographic going to look like then? Uh, in general, uh, the jobs that are being created, in, and this is uh, available, as, uh, I tell everybody at the Knox Rhea meetings, challenge everything I say. Don't take anything I say as a statement of fact. And so right now, there are about uh, within 30 miles of where we are, 30 mile radius of where we are, there's about 10 thousand direct jobs that are being created. Um, whether you use the Korean brake manufacturer up in Clinton or you uh, look at what Denzo is doing in Maryville. You look at the uranium processing facility in Oak Ridge. You look at what's going on with the what I call the boat capital of the United States down in Von Orr. Oh, right, yeah. You, you look at Van Hul bus lines up in Morristown. So you look at the situations where all of the people that are moving here now 
are number one manufacturing companies in their industry in the world. They could go anywhere they wanted to go in the eastern United States. You look at Fresenius, uh, the, one of, if not the largest uh, supplier of kidney dialysis equipment in the world. Their manu East Coast manufacturing facility is in uh, Forks of the River, and their distribution plant now a 490,000 square foot. Uh, Roz, Roz just brought some coffee into the studio, by the way, for uh, for me. Anyways, <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll take since since Roz is here. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> coffee or water? Co coffee. <laughs> Roz, so Thanks, let me Roz. let me just let me just simply say there is no show without Roz. That's the truth. Yeah, that is that is yeah, absolutely yeah, the truth. Yeah, so. And Roz Roz knows it to be the truth. <laughs> which is part of the problem. But anyways, go ahead. <laughs> but so what? So you look at the direct jobs, and in general, these jobs are going to be paying uh, about twenty dollars an hour. Um, many with benef many with significant benefits directly related to them, uh, you wind up that those jobs create a multiplier, depending on which economic study you're looking at, three to four jobs for every new job that's created. So we've got about 20,000 to 25,000 jobs between January of last year and December of next year that are being created in this marketplace. And the and every one of those jobs in general is higher than the median income in Knox County and the city of Knoxville today. Mm. There's no way that the people who are moving here are not significantly wealthier, right? So people who are generally wealthier, uh, in, as a statement, are better educated. That's a pretty well-known statistic that everybody uses. Well, if people who are better educated have choices where they're going to live, they're going to choose to live in a place that has government regulations right. that protect them from uh, an adverse situation occurring. So they want to move to areas that already have government regulation. And one of the things that everybody looks for is that the city of Knoxville has regulations that make it more aesthetically pleasing, mm. the sign ordinance. So, so the Rohero administration has done a lot of things which make Knoxville more aesthetically pleasing. The the reality is that you have people who are better educated, who are choosing a safe place to live, that want to have government regulations protecting them, either with zoning and or sign ordinance or other issues, landscaping restrictions, materials for buildings. When they move into an area, they just simply up the price. They have the ability to pay more, and they just outbid everybody. Recode is creating a situation in which that environment is going to thrive. But let me ask. Uh, was that too long? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you could cut it down just a little bit. Okay. But um, there's uh, there's also the uh, the you know the demographic component and the political component in that with all these new people come in, they'll bring with them the the same sort of attitudes and ideas that they had that they uh, had in their previous location. And so, uh, if you're going to increase the uh, the density or the number of um, uh, 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 housing opportunities inside of the city and therefore grow the population of the city, at some point the city um, of population is going to uh, outweigh the county population, right, and up right. in, you know, for, for 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 generations, the county population has been sort of the counterbalance to the uh, the, the conservative county has been a counterbalance to the more liberal city. Yeah, and if the city uh, population grows, then there's that this go, that balance is going to get get, I, get out of balance. Kelvin, and I hate to interrupt you there, but let me just cut to the chase here. Chris says in Facebook when I. Question: What the new demographic is going to look like? He said, "Dot dot dot Democrat." Now, I don't want to. I'm not trying to put you online or Victor online. This is my personal opinion. Are we talking about voting demographics changing also? Quite possibly. Okay. So. Yeah. So I, I, I don't. You know, the concept of whether they're Democrat or Republican. The issue gets to be that. Uh, I say they're going to be more amenable to um, uh, more regulations and uh, and higher taxes. Well, I, that's, I, I, I had, we heard a city councilwoman on on uh, Hubert Smith's program the other day, not just openly advocating for, but but straight up saying we need to figure out how to convince people of the county and the city to stop driving their cars. Not exactly a, po a policy that's going to go over well, I think personally, with some of the drivers of East Tennessee. But nine thirty one, we'll get Victor's take on this when we get back. Uh, hit this quick news break. Be right back. <laughs> So, at least I'm being sensitive to the fact that I'm talking too long. <laughs> Y'all doing great, I think. I'm really looking forward to the show, man. It's going to be fantastic. Um, How long is this break? Oh, we have till probably 38, 39. we got a while. Be right back. <laughs> 
These chairs are terrible in here, by the way. Are y'all doing the show from the studio? Yeah. All right. Right, right here. Right chair. Right chair. We got Russ to produce and all right. To, you know, or manage and do all that stuff. So I'm pretty sure. I don't know if y'all, which I feel about Facebook Live or anything. It's fun to mess around with for questions and stuff. Y'all can use this Mevo camera if you're still here. Well, yeah. Um, we, you know, John said we could. We're trying to learn how to use Mevo. So. Oh yeah. It's uh, pretty easy. I can just give you a little demo before you leave if you want. No. So for sure, definitely would like to get that. The uh, we're looking at. Um, what we, um, you know, how we want to begin to do it. So I've got a Knox Rhea Facebook page. Okay. Um, so I've got, probably going to do something for that. I've got a Victor Gurney real estate page. Uh, so I'm trying to do the real estate stuff separate from my personal page. Right, right, I hear you. Uh, so, Gee, you could start a whole separate Facebook page just for this show, share it to whoever you wanted to. That that Mevo camera is is uh, it's personally owned by not personally owned, that's weird, but it's owned by a guy named Rich DeForest. He does another program in here on Thursdays, I think. Uh, so he's just sort of lending this to it in the, in the meantime. But uh, the way we do mine is it runs from the Real News Facebook page, and we share it to Talk Radio ninety two point three and a whole bunch of others. But uh, but it's pretty cool. It gives you um like this uh this is the overall view right now. Can right. You see it? And I can zoom in on my face or pull back out or zoom in on silly Trump's face and pull back out or Kelvin's face over here when he's talking. And even if you don't want to do that, it has this thing where it automatically finds faces. Right. So uh, so you guys can be, um, you know, sitting around and talking or whatever, and it'll zoom in on whoever's talking. Sign. Plus, it has this really cool thing with his eye rig where uh, whatever, hang on. Uh, so what they're hearing right now is this. Finds faces. Right. You and I so, talking. Uh, but if I switch the is not standing behind you. Uh, there was an incident recently where an Airbnb landlord was spying on the tenants with cameras, undisclosed. Airbnb shrugged its shoulders and did nothing. The bigger problem has been where local governments have outlawed short-term rentals, and you get put out on the... Good stuff that technology is. So, Kelvin, you want to download the Mevo app to his uh, note, and uh, his okay. note down. He was just showing about how the Mevo camera works. Sure. That, that, that camera belongs to uh, Rich DeForest, who has a, a show on Thursdays. Mm -hmm. So there's a Mevo in our future. <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot control that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah absolutely. Yeah, I, I was actually just showing him how to control it. That's what this phone is, is solely dedicated to that Mevo camera over there. Um, switch between audio sources, so they're hearing us right now, but we go on air, they hear the actual mic quality that's coming through, it's pretty nice. Plus that way they can hear Roz talking back there. Is Roz running y'all's show? Who's doing that? Yeah? Alright, it'll be good. Got to put the music list together. Alright. I, 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 I cannot hijack. Uh, the camera with my phone camera. Right now? No, you couldn't right now. <laughs> I think I'd have to drop off first. <laughs> that would be nice though. I can put the camera solely on your face if you want to. No, that's okay. okay. And if you want to keep my little studio accoutrement, by all means. Most people don't get it though, so, so don't worry about keeping it. I have an anti, an ironic anti-Trump theme here. This is signed by Glenn Jacobs for me. Uh, that my favorite thing I think is my uh, my libertarian bathroom sign. Exactly. You see that one? It's a dragon and a unicorn. It says whatever. Just wash your hands. <laughs> that's a, that's the libertarian take, isn't it? Now, I don't care what you identify as. I don't. Okay. Just wash your hands. <laughs> I, the girl you had on, uh, uh, I guess this was just voluntary. Yeah, uh, sure, voluntary. Sure, voluntary. She, uh, where is she from originally? Is she from here, in Knoxville? I don't know where she's from originally. I met her when she was in Knoxville. She was originally working pretty close with the Libertarian folks. Right. Now, she has since, I don't know how much to give away to this on Facebook, she's since distanced herself a little bit from the Libertarian Party. She still considers herself, I think she calls little L Libertarian philosophy, but she's really an anarcho-capitalist. I think it's just healthy for her, for the audience to have her on the show to consider. Anarcho-capitalist? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, right? I know. I never really dived into that philosophy too much until, uh, until I met her, but... Um, but her version is, is uh, anarcho-capitalism, I would, I would venture to say, is government is only necessary where it's absolutely necessary, and it's basically not necessary at all, right? I think the way they take their approach on, on prisons, for example, is the only people that are, should be in prison are those that you never want to be out of prison. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. 
So, uh, so I don't know. Anyways, but she has some, some very interesting perspectives. I think it's healthy for the audience to consider, like, how libertarian are you really? Right. Because I don't agree with her most everything she says, but we do we do great stuff together. Anyway, sorry. Uh, no, it's that whole thought process, because mm, everything about this country was created by, I mean, is a contract, right? Yeah, right, so, yeah. So what gets lost to so many people is the fact that everything about this country is a contract. Mm. All real estate is a contract, right? So it doesn't make any difference whether you look at the Plymouth Compact or the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. Those are all contracts between government and people, mm. between people and how it's going to be governed going forward. Um, by the way, this is what I think I'm going to do. Come back with a question that Facebook has for Kelvin, um, and then uh, I'm going to uh, just recap a little bit of stuff where we're coming from, get you on pitch show one more time. I'm going to go to Victor for a question. Um, maybe bring up some issues that, uh, that what we were talking about the other day with the apartment complex and the sidewalk in West Hills in particular. Just really play out the notion of, like, hey, by the way, whether you know it or not, government does affect your life by you paying some other yeah, people's yeah, yeah. stuff type thing. But. Nine thirty-seven in the morning. Welcome back to Real News. That's one of my favorite intros as well. Oh, a lot of our little bumper intros I, I really enjoy. Is Scott Joplin? <laughs> aside, yes, aside, it is. That was Scott Joplin. Yeah, pineapple rag. Yeah, there you go. See, that's why Kelvin. Yeah, Kelvin's the man, man. Uh, Roz, aside from that one where somebody's playing the ukulele, we still haven't figured out who came in here and you know hijacked the studio to record that. Don't but, do that. Yeah. Don't do that. Yeah. I know you're ashamed of that one, but that's one of my favorites. Yeah, well, it's not me. They don't know it's me. Hey, uh, question for Facebook for Kelvin here. By the way, we're talking about Recode a little bit. I don't think this, this topic needs any any recap or reintroduction in this area, um, but uh, Recode Knoxville is the topic at hand. We are talking right now uh, about the the new show on Saturday here. 10 o'clock, is that right? Is that the time? Yeah? 10 o'clock. IPR, intersection between politics and real estate. Kelvin, some of Facebook has a question. Um, ask Kelvin if there's any similarities uh, of the attempt, and this doesn't make much sense to me. I'm new to this area, so you probably know much more than I do. There any similarities between the attempt to bring in nine counties, one vision versus the tactics. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 oh, there's a blast from yeah. the past. <laughs> nine counties, one vision for the tactics to bring in recode. See any similarities there? Oh, I hadn't even thought about it from that direction, but it, I, I would say yes. Uh, lack, lack of participation would be right there at the top of the yeah, list. Yeah, you know, and, and the, uh, the somewhat, um, it, it seems to all be a lot of it happening behind a curtain. Okay. Behind, you know, behind closed doors. Um, there's not a lot of uh, not a lot of sunlight or uh, open discussion being uh, uh, engaged in in this, and I you know in, in no small part I have to kind of fault the uh, the local media for that. I mean, recode is a, a fairly difficult thing to explain absolutely in in, 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 in a thirty second soundbite, uh, and uh, it, it is uh, very it's kind of, kind of technical and uh, and a lot of people. In very short order, we'll you know hit the snooze button when when you yeah. start talking about it. Because in thirty seconds, you have to screen, describe not just what what it is, but why it's potentially problematic. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know we were, we, we kind of talked about um, um, mentioned that um, uh, you know other day when we were talking about the local media. You know, I, I stopped routinely or regularly reading the uh, the uh, Sentinel when uh, you know, a few years ago they were uh, there was a story written by a. Um, uh, AP reporter in New Mexico about a an event that happened in Farragut. That, and so, that, that's crazy. Yeah, and yeah. You know, once I and saw say, that, say I that th one more time, just so people really understand, yeah, get the grasp of what a, you just said. It was a story that was written by an AP reporter uh, in uh, New Mexico <laughs> about an event that happened in Farragut. <laughs> that's nice. You know, when I saw that, I thought, that. okay, that, that's it. The Sentinel is dead. <laughs> yeah, right. So I guess you would agree, in, in part, I suppose, with, with Steve Hunley's taking this whole thing. I don't know if you want to go as extreme as him, but Steve Hunley's whole take of, uh, okay, so, so it's not exactly a lot of public exposure. We don't have a lot of public involvement here. Maybe some of that is, is based upon a lack of public knowledge. But, and, but I want to ask you. How in the world is Knoxville allowing the city council to get away with this? Do you understand what I'm saying? It seems like we're fresh off a take of those nerves still being raw, those nerves being exposed, the backdoor closed room type meetings, the moving and shifting from 5 p.m. to 3 p.m. Of, of not letting the voice of Knoxville have a voice. How in the world are they getting away with this? Um, I mean, let's face it. Easily. Yeah, easily. <laughs> let's just, just face it. Most people do not pay attention to local politics. What's going on in their in their backyard? Which is the reason we're doing the show? Yeah, 
I mean, but, you know, there's there's no shortage of information that uh, that they get bombarded about and bombarded with when it uh, comes to the national issues. Mm. You know, it's it's all over the internet. It's all over the uh, the national news. It's all over the radio station, radio shows that they uh, to listen to. They're all talking about you know what's going on in the national stage, and what's going on in the local stage kind of gets you know short shrift. You know, mm. after you've ha- after you've had your full meal of the national news, right. there's not a lot of left room left over to have the you know the, the local dessert. Yeah, and if you want to eat that local dessert, it's not exactly sweet. I'm going to give Victor a chance to give it a take, and then we'll go to JB on the Crown Pots call number. There's a, a really a strong activist in Knoxville, Jamie Rowe, and Jamie and I rarely agree on anything at all. So in 25 or 30 years of interactions, uh, but she made a comment at one of the Recode meetings about um, the um, – the fact that RICO changes your neighbor's property. Hmm. And it so what happens is you may be happy with where you are, but the neighbor's property is going to change. So you wind up with a situation that uh, said Jamie Rowe, it's Carlene Malone, excuse me. Carlene Malone made the statement, and Carlene and I never agree. So, <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the, that's the issue. What, so what's happening is Recode is creating the opportunity for your neighbor's property to change its zoning in the future. And this is what impacts the property values going forward in Knoxville. Let me go to JB on the Crown Plaza call number right now. If you have a question for these two guests, 865 uh, 888 I'm going to give JB and these other two gentlemen the remaining portion of this segment. I might just step out because this is probably the guy who should be hosting this segment anyways, JB. JB, go ahead, buddy. Greetings, fellas. How are you doing today? Very well, JB. Everybody knows Victor is, he call him the king of Candleland, the ninja of numbers. He's got the numbers. <laughs> but Kelvin, Kelvin we call the Black Avenger. <laughs> JB, my man. <laughs> the Lebanon Flash, the Brown Tornado, the Black Avenger. And by the way, Kelvin, you almost won a race on a radio basis. Uh, ride-in program. That's you remember? Oh, yes. I, that, that when I ran for county clerk, I just barely... That's a joke. You almost won. <laughs> I just barely missed the cutoff to get on the uh, on the ballot in, awesome. in, in the fall. I've got a lot of stories I can tell you about Kelvin, but uh, the statute hasn't run yet, so I can't <laughs> But I'm Victor. Victor, let me say, first of all, thank you for your leadership in standing up against the in, in, inexplicable uh, James White Parkway policy. Uh, your, pre- your story about how Biltmore Forest survives well, uh, how people avoid Chapman Highway, uh, how it's so dangerous. It, it didn't expect people ask me who want to come here, what the hell's going on Chapman Highway? And I said, I don't know. Mm. I, it's inexplicable. I don't, Victor, I, can you explain it? No, there's no, uh, there's no rational reason that the James White Parkway was not built other than the delusion. Uh, and this is my view. And again, I tell everybody, you know, challenge everything that I say, but. No, d- definitely. We will. Don't we? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, there, so the reality was Chapman Highway should have been improved 30 years ago. Chapman Highway should be improved today. There's no reason that, that the James White Parkway wouldn't also be built. And if you just look at Knoxville, uh, all of the other major tertiary streets as i call them kingston pike is parallel by interstate 40 broadway and central clinton highway uh have interstate 75 so Asheville highway has interstate 40 uh only going south is there not any connection to anything su- south of the river by an interstate highway and to not be able to move large volumes of traffic safely down an interstate system into the heart of Knoxville seems to be uh, a, a bad economic choice if you were spending tens of millions of dollars in subsidies to make the city of Knoxville a more interesting and attractive place. Why not allow the people from Sevier County to get here easily? Why not open up the land in South Knoxville so that we could build more housing for more people that are moving here so they've got better access to the interstate system rather than having to drive down Boyd's Creek Road to get to Highway 6. It's, it's insanity. Hey, can I, can I ask you all, too? I have not been Did I stutter? Did no, I stutter? no, no. Okay. No, you didn't at all. Hey, I have not been following this issue at all. I want Kelvin to give a take. But but I, I heard a lot of people react strangely, I should say, at Rojera's address at the end of, their, of the location of her address. Was there anything to that? I'm going to just make it something bigger than that. Well, well no, she's, she's do, she did the address at the land that the city acquired back from the Department of Transportation okay. to uh, do an entrance park. So right now, South Knoxville has a private interstate system, effectively. That's uh, so. 
uh, and I made these comments years ago. Uh, so the if you look at Chapman Highway, uh, you want to be uh, east of Chapman Highway. You want to be north of Moody Avenue, uh, but to Imes Park and to the river. Anything in that quadrant right there, uh, right, because of what Rojero is about to do with this new park, is probably going to double in value again in the next. Th so in 2013, I said properties in South Knoxville would double in five years, and that true turned out to be very true. What you're about to see right now is Rojero is creating a central park effect in, in South Knoxville mm. and all of the properties inside that that bubble. And basically, it, you've got the primary core area, which is like you've got the, the people who can see Central Park from the uh, 14th floor of their, uh, of their apartment, right? And then you've got the people who can see from the 40th floor. And so you wind up that. What I mean by that is the people who are inside that Moody Avenue corridor have an increasing value opportunity because they'll be able to walk to everything, the redevelopment on Severe Avenue, the parks that are being created, the Sutri Landing. And then you go out to Stone Road where Woodland Drive comes in before you go over the Red Bud Hill, before you go up over the hill towards Colonial Village because that's where it gets nasty driving as you go up and down the hills after you pass Stone Road on Chapman Highway. Hmm. And I mean, let me one more step before I have to go, uh, Victor. When the city talked about this, this plan, which was spoken about WBIR, the 2005 to 18 grid with 76 dead, and they said, well, uh, Chapman Highway was removed or, uh, from the Improve Act because Maryland, uh, Madeline wanted it taken out. They talked about these numbers. What they forgot to tell the people is that the Hinley Street Bridge was closed for almost four years, and nobody went into that uh, end of Chapman Highway. And as you said, people avoided it anyway. And even when they opened the bridge back, traffic was reduced. So in essence, that makes it. And they say, well, look, that's the safe part of Chapman Highway. Well, nobody was driving there. I'd say 20 deaths, but that very low rate of, of, uh, of driving is a too high a number. They're actually making an argument for diverting traffic to make the place safer. There is no rational reason not to complete uh, 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 Chapman. And by the way, you're right about making Central Park in South Knoxville. That's what a friend of mine from New York said. You're exactly correct. I don't know, JB. Listen, in, in Facebook we have Chris saying, look, we don't need the James White Parkway when Recode's going to take care of this for us by, by taking care of those old-fashioned things called cars. You know what I mean? <laughs> no one's <laughs> driving those right anyway. We can walk anyway. and ride our tricycles over there. <laughs> That's right. One last word. Uh, anything that, that combines Carlene Malone, Barbara Pilo, Nick Delavolpe, <laughs> and, and, uh, and your guest there uh, uh, has got to have something. That binding that group together <laughs> Because, like Victor, means that there's some. These people have been around a long time. Yes, they yes. know what they're talking about. They're not some fly by night. Carly Malone, Victor Pelo, Dick Delavope, and Victor Jarnigan. If they agree on something that there is a problem with Rico, it's time to take a look at it. No, in all sincerity, JB, what out of the, out of a room full of that those people, could you get a consensus on almost anything else? No. Hell no. <laughs> and what time it is. <laughs> and you're not off the hook, Black Avenger. I've got three or four. Stories. By the way, my cousin does want you to call her, okay? Hey, hey, call her, okay? Just, love you guys. Love yeah, you just text together. me the phone number. <laughs> right, Don't play me like that, brother. <laughs> we appreciate it. Call JB. Hey, there goes JB, 9.50 in the morning. Go ahead, this break coming up. Come back with some more information about Recode and other things. Uh, Follow-up question for Kelvin in the Facebook here. Been fantastic. Your stuff in town. If you like what you're hearing now, it's only going to be more of the same on Saturday mornings, 10 a.m., right? 10 a.m. Right IPR, Intersection Politics and Realty. Be right back. Yep, you all know JB. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, yeah. I know it's not my uh, previous radio. Thing. Okay. All right. I still don't know what the guy's real name is. He seems like uh, he knows what he's talking about, though. Oh, shoot. Um, I've never met him. He's a. He's. You know, he, he really makes an effort to be informed yeah, oh yeah. On, on the comments that he's making. Right? Yeah. So it's not I, anybody that makes the effort to be informed is, is great. Oh, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And on an issue like this, it's, it's really difficult to be that well informed. But I, 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 can you turn the Yeah, yeah. Hang on a second. Of course. This war on drugs needs our intervention. Since 2014, Addiction Hope and Helpline has helped people struggling with drugs and alcohol. When the phone rings, we help people when they need it the most. When we get a caller into treatment, it feels good. It's a blessing. If you're struggling, drinking, using, and need to get clean, don't suffer alone in silence. Call Addiction Hope and Helpline. Our people understand, and many are also in recovery. 
call for support and strength. You can call for someone who can't or isn't willing. It's an act of love. Together we can help you beat this thing and erase addiction from your vocabulary once and for all. Call 800-860-4006 This is Steve Vaskart of Wealth and Retirement Strategies. I help baby boomers create a dependable retirement plan. My mission statement is to teach you the wisdom of how money works for better stewardship, to potentially have more, to give more, and to leave more. If becoming a better steward of your wealth is important to you and you need a dependable retirement plan as well, call for my video that explains all the ways I will help you. Please call 691-1211. That's 691-1211. When you drive onto the lot at Fox Toyota, there's a welcome sign without there being a welcome sign. You just know you're welcome. Test drive one of the new vehicles today on the lot at Fox Toyota and be treated like family. Family owned and operated for decades. Fox Toyota, exit 122 off I-75 North or call them toll free 844-818-0255. Check out their website at foxtoyotaclinton.com. That's foxtoyotaclinton.com. The views and opinions heard on the programs which air on Talk Radio 92.3 and AM 760 are those of the hosts and guests of those programs and not necessarily those of the station or management. We stand with, oh, that was super <laughs> Yeah, the colonel would say stuff and he would answer it before he'd actually All right. Hey, John, I'm just going to bring us back in and take a view there. Right? Yeah. In your picture. Yeah, that's a remix version right there. A little, uh, little beat drop out. DJ Roz. Hey, you always know it's a big day when uh, the Admiral John Adams steps in the studio. Take it away, sir. Right, right. <laughs> uh, you know, the w one thing about not being able to be here all the time to work the board is I was looking for that clip before hmm. the music, the, the one about Wednesday hump day. Oh, yeah, yeah. I couldn't, you know, Roz is a pro. She knows where it's at. I, I, I couldn't find it. I just wanted to come in and tell you that what you're hearing on the show this morning is a good example of what you can expect on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. Mm. We always love to do local programming when we can, and especially if it's good. Now, these guys have faces for radio, <laughs> so they work well with what... <laughs> hey, I've always said I've got the face for radio and the voice for print. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, I just want to let you know that I'm excited about this show, and, and Victor and I have been talking about it for a while, and it's just a... A program that we feel is really going to be relevant and something you need to be listening to to keep up on what's going on. Now, my question is, I live over uh, off of 129. Personal question coming. Nah. Uh, yeah. Well, well, yeah, somewhat. Uh, over off of 129, I'll kill you highway, uh, it would, where it is under construction, it seems, for eternity. Right. 25-year um, plan. Really? Yeah, 25 years ago it was planned. But I also heard that that bridge uh, there at Maloney was going to be, be finished last year. So anyway, that's not the point. It's uh, a government operation, okay? <laughs> yeah, so, so it is going to be finished eventually. My real point is where I live, I would frequent, I frequent uh, the Publix and, the, and would, used to, well, not frequent, I wouldn't say, but Walmart right there, University Commons. Walmart is closed down a lot I mean, a lot of university students are complaining because it's closed down. I heard that it could very well be because of Cumberland Avenue. Do you do, would you agree with that? That that people are, have difficulty getting up and down Cumberland Avenue no. and getting there. No, that Walmart did not close because of Cumberland Avenue. Just what a lack of uh, a, a lack clientele? a lack of enough business in their basic business model. The impact of. Cumberland Avenue by itself, the amount of traffic that that would have limited coming to the Walmart because Listen, I avoid Cumberland when I can. Right. So the turn horrible. So the turn to uh, get to the Walmart Center was before you go under the railroad bridge. So you wind up being able to get to the Walmart and the Publix prior to 
um, getting on to Cumberland Avenue, and the people who live on the other side, literally, as I mentioned, in South Knoxville, they get on the closed portion of the James White Parkway, and they drive around the city of Knoxville, getting off on the Kingston Pike exit. So the people who live in South Knoxville, the closest Walmart and the closest grocery store was the one on the other side at uh, that ju- where at University Commons. The, the Walmart made the decision to close because they just simply were not getting volume numbers that they needed to keep the store open. And why is that? I know that you, every time I'd go in there, three-quarters were university students. And I'm guessing because in the summer there, there's no business because they're all at home? Well, there's, uh, there's a, a large contingency of uh, students and people that are using the Walmart year-round. But, again, it's the volume total, the, the total mm-hmm. volume number. The Publix does well because uh, it backs up to Sequoia Hills. So Publix is going to do better now. It's going to so that you wind up with a situation where the Publix can continue to increase sales. The Walmart uh, didn't have a full line grocery store in it, so you wind up with what Walmart's the number one grocery in, or number two grocer in America. So without a gro- without a gro- without a grocery in the store, it's already it doesn't match up That's with where their point. new their new model is going. So it's they hardly just, had anything for produce or whatever in there. It's right. just horrible. So you wind up with a situation that it was a merchandise only store, and with online coming so strongly, there wasn't any attraction to get people into the store. So it it just was a model that when it was started, it was a great idea. It just didn't seem to meet the sales volumes. Otherwise, Walmart would not have closed it. Mm. Hey, uh, by the way, IPR intersection between politics and real estate. Did that answer your question? Yeah. IPR intersection between politics and real estate. Victor Jernigan, Kev, uh, Kelvin Moxley, both my guests today. You can hear that program 10 a.m. here on 92.3 FM, AM 760, WETR. Sandwiched perfectly in between the other two programs. 957 right now, news traffic weather, all that. Uh, Glenn Beck coming up next. Stick around for that. We'll be back tomorrow doing a big uh, Richard Spires are trying to set up a pretty cool guest for CWT tomorrow. That's Conspiracy Theory Thursday. Be, uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Oh, thanks, y'all. Good stuff. I may sap y'all's knowledge more often going forward. Uh, if this repair stuff starts popping off, that way I can basically exploit it, it, y'all to make my show look that much better, you know? It, 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 hey, it's not, so you wind up with a, it's going to be voted on in two weeks, so we'll make any difference. 14th, right? I know, that's that's what I've been trying to, to figure out, is, do we have enough time left to do le- legitimately anything? And I say legitimately, because I've had people call in to say, we need to get some attorney that's going to issue an injunction, which I don't ever see happening possibly. Other people would say we need to flood the room with three to four to five hundred people. I don't think that matters at all. We need to do something to get Knox News Sentinel to report on it. I, if they have it now, WBIR and WET are going to care about it in the next two weeks. So I don't know. My personal take is it's probably said and done. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any way that it gets stopped. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So so what I predicted to happen. A year ago is exactly what has happened. They've taken out all the density opportunities. So um, the, the way the density works is going to be uh, completely different in, uh, in Rico. And they're keeping in all the things which make Knoxville a more aesthetically pleasing city. So it's going to be just fewer people are going to be able to live here. And more people are going to, and the people that are going to live here are going to be wealthy. Yeah, Kelvin, I'll end my stream right now. We can give that up to you. Okay. Do a little dry run if you want. Hey, uh, Facebook, y'all the best in the West and the East. Um, I'll let you know on Facebook who the guest is tomorrow. Also, uh, I'll try and make sure to follow up with Richard to put all the Black Guns Matter, Black Guns Matter stuff out on our Facebook. That guy's incredible. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Oh, the other thing I want to direct Facebook to also. We're cur- I don't want to air names on. Well, I'll tell you who it is. Doesn't really matter, but. Um, currently in contact with a city council member that's willing to at least in print answer whatever questions we have. Not sure what's in print and doesn't want to come on air, but whatever. Send those to our Facebook if you want to. It should be uh, pinned at the top of the page. If you have questions, uh, we'll get those over to him. Uh, yeah, I guess that should be it. Love y'all. As always, see you next time.